Date point. First contact day. 10th year, AV. Capital station. Capital system. Dominion space. Officer Regari. Clan Whitecrest attached to the Mother Supreme. You're both courting a controversy, you know. A scandal, even, given how close you both are to me. Regari's head duck of agreement had an unconsciously immature, cubbish quirk to it that came naturally when Gimyu engaged her mother's instincts. The Mother Supreme was now silver from ear tip to foot, and thoroughly venerable. Over the years of working together, her relationship with Regari had thawed from purely professional to something of a friendship, but she was still the mother. And when she gave advice, deference was instinctive. I know, he agreed reluctantly. Human ideas are in Gowian culture. I've been saying well abreast of the backlash. We both have, which is why we've only talked about it. Even talking about it is heresy in some camps. That's a human word. Indeed it is. Regari caught the sad irony in Gimyu's agreement. We're a free society, he pointed out. Free to speak our minds, free to act and do as we please, so long as we cause no harm, aren't we? So it has been since before the females were united, Guimui agreed. But I note, we have never actually been cunning enough to codify those freedoms in law, and in the meantime, some people's ideas of what constitutes harm have broadened, spreading out to cover a wider area, but I think becoming shallower in the process. The humans need those things coded in law, Regari pointed out. In fact, they were, from what I gather, something of a revolutionary concept when first introduced. We, meanwhile, have always taken them as self-evident. You don't need a law granting people the freedom to... to breathe, or to eat. Gimui chuffed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, she quoted. Regari, being the one who had first introduced that document to her, recognised the quotation instantly. Missing, of course, the irony that, if they really were self-evident then they would never have had to write them down. Grimmy, Dark nodded herself. Meanwhile, we did find them self-evident, she observed. And yet you're warning me that Ima and I are courting controversy by preferring each other's company? Dare I whisper the word monogamy? It's not. She's had other cups since mine. It's just that we still enjoy each other's company, and we still feel much the same as we did when we sighed that cup. Regari stood and paced the room. And this, somehow, is a brewing scandal. A male and a female liking each other and wishing to spend time together, rather than simply remembering one another as a fond, temporary dalliance? Perhaps those truths aren't so self-evident after all. Perhaps Gowians have all just... thought too much alike, up until now. Grimmie chittered loudly, and at length at that one. Oh, <laughs> she gasped, trying to recover. If only we did! There'd be no need for a mother supreme, and I could retire and live out my time, surrounded by cubs and happy young mothers. She regained her composure. I noted the slightly offended set of Regari's ears. Ha, I am sorry. You may be right. We are discussing the adulteration of our culture by alien ideas, after all. That was probably inevitable the moment we made first contact, Regari grumbled. We know that, Gumi gestured to the station they were aboard. Many Gowians may not, and this is the root of our problem. We are being changed by these ideas, whether we like it or not. These ideas of heresy and taboo are just as much of a pollution of what it means to be Gowian as pizza, pancakes, meditation and monogamy. Then there's poor Mune. I never imagined that I'd see the day when a young, healthy, intelligent and very pretty female was shunned because no male will court her for fear of the political consequences. Regari snarled a little angry laugh. Oh yes, they'll hire her to provide hand-to-hand -hand combat instruction, but mating with a freak? He growled a little. If she wasn't young enough to be one of my cubs, I might approach you with a contract myself, just to spite them. Why not? Gimme asked. You're already flirting with scandal with Ima, and you'd be actively seeking it by courting Mune. Why should age make a difference at that point? Maybe your example is all that's needed to rehabilitate an outcast. Regari fell silent. He was still considering the suggestion when the communicator in his pocket buzzed. He tapped with a claw. They're ready for you in the council chamber, he said. It's about time. Where's my stick? Regari handed it to her. Grimui had many walking sticks these days, and each one was a calculated statement. For today, she had selected the natural, knurled one made of Simbreen Pinkwood, a now extinct species that had once occupied one small portion of a continent, now as are long swallowed up by death order terraforming. The humans had logged the lot rather than let it be ruined by the advancing tide of the disease, and had sold the wood to collectors to drum up funds. Grimui had snapped up three trees worth, 
craftsmen from every clan on Gao and beyond, had vied for the privilege of creating the sticks, desk and curiosity she had commissioned, predicting that the prestige of creating for her would improve their own mating chances. Gurimi in turn had encouraged them by selecting lesser known, obscure males for the privilege. The famous ones, she had reasoned, didn't need the help. Now, the stick tapped sharply on the decorative stone tiles of the capital station concourse as they left the Gowin ambassador quarters. Dominion security guards, two Vustuk, two Kumbru, fell in line behind the entourage of four Gowin guards from Clan Flashfang, all painfully eager young males and all. Regari has seen to this personally, trained to handle threats up to and including a human. It was quite the little procession. Gurimi had chosen simple charcoal robes that offset her fur, and wore three loops of fine gold chain clasped to each ear. The effect was venerable and dignified, still understated, but enough to make her stand out next to Regari's severe black uniform, or her guard's combat harnesses. This was a big occasion, a galactic broadcast that had taken some negotiation to secure. Even Regari didn't know what the Mother Supreme had planned for the address she was about to give to the Dominion Grand Council, but he was looking forward to it. Every species had automatic membership and presence on the Grand Council, even if they were not Dominion members. Even if that species was an enthusiastic member of the Celsius Alliance, there were dissenters. Ones were chosen to side with the Dominion, representing their species. An unpopular minority at home, perhaps, but still there. The only vacant seats belonged to the declining species, who no longer cared to show up, and to the humans. There was a space for them, but it remained unoccupied. Regari wasn't even sure if the Death Orders knew that space existed. Gurumi created a stir when she walked right past the podium that had been set up for her, and instead strode into the area designed for humans. The Susurus this move generated soon became a white noise that only subsided, when the chairman, a rotund Vigork nearly as large as a young Guvernang, slammed his gavel into the desk in front of him, with enough force to dent the wood. Mother Supreme Gurumi, he began addressing her, that place is for the delegates from Earth. The delegates from Earth, Chairman, Gumi replied, speaking with surprising force and clarity for age, do not know that this seat exists. This council has never seen fit to inform them of it, nor invite them to attend. I am taking the liberty of speaking on their behalf. The Chairman slammed down his gavel again, as the gavel species took to muttering to one another again. Can I not persuade you to take the podium? he asked. You cannot, Chairman. The Chairman considered her for a while, then backed down. Then please, continue. Goyme accepted the concession with a slight bow to the chair, then turned to address the council as a whole. Goians and humans share a fondness for base 10 mathematics, she began. Which is why I note that, by the calendar of the planet Earth, it has now been exactly 10 years since hunters raided their city of Vancouver. Less than three of their years later, the human race achieved faster than light manned flight for the first time. Those 10 years have been tumultuous and interesting, and often controversial. She tapped her stick down twice. The Dominion's response to this singular death or species has been one of fear and mistrust. And this stick I am holding is a symbol of why that fear is justified, being made from the wood of a tree now extinct due to them. I am not here to argue against the policy of the last ten years. The past cannot be undone, but to share a vision of policy for the next ten. This time, the delegates were polite enough to remain silent and listen. The humans are here to stay, she announced. Even if we never see one again, even if they were to retreat behind their quarantine field and remain there, they have already changed the outlook of many species on a great many things. Even now the questions are being asked. Why haven't we united to fight the hunters? Why has the Dominion Alliance war gone on for so long without ceasefire or negotiation? Why do we transport goods in vulnerable freighters and lose their crews to hunters and piracy when displacement jump drives render the very concept of a freighter obsolete? I have seen personally just how powerful and dangerous humans are. I have seen for myself some of the plagues that are one human visitor. My clan sister could have unleashed on Gao, which would surely have killed her entire species if we had lacked the technology to protect ourselves. Humans are undeniably dangerous, but so too are the tools that we used to build the station. So too are fire or the knives used to prepare food. She tapped her stick again. Unlike those things, humans are thinking, living beings, fellow intelligent life, which is a rare and precious thing in this galaxy. My clan sister would have wept and been thrown into the kind of despair none of us here can imagine if she had been forced to watch the Gowian people die through no real fault of her own. They know or are learning that they are dangerous. 
Where it is already too late for them to prevent the damage, they are trying to repair it as best they can. Where it is not, they are taking precautions to prevent harm. On their behalf, given their absence from this assembly, I humbly beseech the council to... She was cut off. Blue lighting, the universal colour of emergency and alarm, slammed on, and a deep howl filled the council chamber. She was still standing bemused by it, ears twitching back and forth, when Regari took her by the arm and escorted her with inexorable firmness towards the exit. Regari, what is happening? she asked. The male's ears were pricked up and his teeth bared, sure signs of stress, alertness and concentration. He was listening to words that Gyumi could not hear, and reading words she could not see. The station's under attack, he reported tersely. Who by? That's still being... His ears rose, then flattened against his skull. Regari! The swarm of swarms, he quickened the pace. The hunters are back. Aesmith Shaman, Falkfer, Simbreen, the Far Reaches. Major Owen Powell, fall in. Fall in and listen the fuck up. The operators had been in the middle of tidying up the barracks and doing basic chores like the washing up and laundry. They immediately dropped what they were doing and fell in around him, giving Powell their full and undivided attention. He didn't skip a beat. Ten minutes ago, our listening post in the capital system sent back his message boy, reporting a massive spike in activity on Haunted communication channels and several sensor contacts. The swarm's attacking capital station. Gear up and get on the shuttle. We dust off in free. Go, go! Gearing up was as simple as grabbing the emergency bags that they all kept in the locker room for this exact reason and sprinting for the waiting shuttlecraft, which was set down on the base's helipad. It was a simple, stock Dominion model, little more than a dull grey cuboid with a window in the front and a door in the back. No human company had yet developed a version that the armed services liked well enough to buy, much to the grumbling of the people who had to use them, who were universally of the opinion that literally anything human made would have been an improvement. They were aboard and bolted in less than two minutes. Powell stood towards the front, gripping an overhead strap to stabilise himself, as the little craft lurched forward. Right, this operation is called Nova Hound, he began, raising his voice over the engines. Lucky for us, we've got an old plan for this exact scenario. The attack began 10 or 15 minutes ago. Our estimated response time is 40 or 50 minutes. By the time we're on the scene, the defending fleet will have been brushed aside and the station itself would have been overrun by haunters for a good half hour. Safe to assume that civilian casualties are total, and in this station's case there's a good 12,000 people. VIPs, council members, ambassadors, visiting dignitaries have all got security details with them, which we believe makes enough difference. We have schematics for Capital Station. We think we know where they're likely to be hauled up. Our mission is rescue and extraction of as many dignitaries and civilians as we can. The secondary objectives include causing as much damage as possible to the swarm, intelligence gathering and propaganda. We'll be deploying on Caledonia, which has been refitted as a staging hospital ship. The V-Class destroyers are the front line. They'll hold the swarm by the nose. They've got the staying power in Ewar. Mimidon will be serving in his new role as on-field energy support, keeping the V-Classes charged. Meanwhile, USAF TS-2 squadrons will deliver the killing blows and provide close screen. Both of them are there as a big distraction to let the men on this shuttle accomplish the real mission. Our overwatch is provided by jets, led by Lieutenant Ross aboard HMS Caledonia. Jones, Murray, Price, your covert infiltration and assault. Your job is to drive the outboard and dive onto the station. Effect quiet ingress as close to the target section as possible. Blazinski, Firth, you're on the bolt too, as am I. We help secure our foothold and dig in and command. Once we're in, the protectors, that's Ares and Burgess, and defenders, Stevenson, Sykes, Akiyama and Vandenberg, jump in from the ship ordinary. That's the assault team's cue to go monkey shit on the hunters. Leave none of them alive. Delta sets up the evacuation array that maintains our perimeter, our wrong combat camera. Protectors should be handling the refugees. Hunters usually kill out right, so there probably won't be a lot of medicine to do. So you're also humping ammo and gear for the assault team. The evac array will be sending the civilians to the deck of HMS Caledonia. We'll be using our default call signs. I'm stainless. Any questions? Sir? Stevenson raised his hand. Do we bring a backup array? Powell nodded. Yes. Any further questions? No? Are we clear? Yes, sir. Right. Give me your war names. Longlegs. Sterling. Highland. Righteous. Starfall. Titan. Thor. Rebar. Snapfire. Baseball. Warhorse. And don't you fucking forget it. Lads, let's do this right. Capital Station. Orbiting Planet Garden. Capital System. Dominion Space. Regari. Every shot we fire misses. They're just not there anymore. I don't know where they learned a trick like this, but we're losing ships fast out here and inflicting no damage that I can see. No hope of holding the field. 
but Gary was part of a wedge of Gaurians pushing against a tide of stampeding life forms. Already one of his men was badly hurt, having been kicked hard by a panicking visitor. His role wasn't to push and shove and shout and try to make room. He was too busy coordinating with the largest and most senior craft in the Gowian contingent of the security fleet. The CGC Winter Fire. None. You reach here to the shuttle? Its captain was a white crest, one of Agari's brothers, both by clan and, he suspected, a half sibling genetically. Everything's panicking in here, McGurry grunted. They raised his voice to be heard as a flock of waning Krumbula became the latest obstacle for them to push against. Most of them are running away from the escape ships for some stupid reason. How long can you give me? If we let all the others die first, a pour of minute six at the outside. McGurry assessed matters. They made it only a few hundred meters at best from the council chamber since the attack began. Not good enough, he declared. I know. I'm sorry, brother, but at this point we have to treat everything aboard the station as lost. We may as well salvage some assets from this and carry on to Galvon- The link went dead, with a sharp squeal in Regari's ear. Winter fire, you broke up there, he told them. Silence. Winter fire, come in. Officer Regari, CGS Winter Fire is destroyed, one of the other ships said. We're warping out, nothing we can do. May as well save what we can. Sorry. Regari! He turned. The Mother Supreme was leaning heavily against the wall, panting and grimacing, with a hand pressed to her chest. Mother Supreme! She slumped, sliding to the ground. Concerned males gathered round and Regari rushed to her side. Do you hear me? Oh, don't! She coughed. At least my age is getting me first, before the hunters do. And the men exchanged glances, aware that they weren't to be so lucky. We can still- Don't be so stupid! She snapped. Then her breath rattled horribly. She was clearly in hideous pain. She continued, in a gentler tone. Regari, you can escape. I will only slow you down, and so will these soldiers. Get... She heaved and coughed, but fought through it. Get to the diplomatic shuttle, and activate the emergency displacement recall. Tell them... Her strength was failing by the second, and when she repeated, Tell them... She was almost inaudible. Regari leaned in close. He only barely heard her last words. He closed her eyes. I'll tell them, he promised. Officer? One of the soldiers asked him, clearly expecting an order. What? McGurry asked, surveying the ceiling. What do we do? First, you stand back, McGurry ordered. When they did so, he aimed his pulse rifle and blasted the vent cover out of the ceiling with three precise shots. Second, he said, sling the rifle over his shoulder. You give me a boost up into that vent. And they did so. Gowian gravity was just a little higher than Galactic Standard, and between two of them, he was launched to the height of a ceiling that could accommodate even the tallish or bulkiest Gunvlug. He caught the edge, swan there for a second, and then hauled himself up and into the air duct. And third? One of the soldiers asked. Regari unslung his gun and got his bearings. You kill as many of them as you can, and you don't let them take you or your brothers alive, he told them. Goodbye. HMS Violent, Simbrine Orbit, The Far Reaches. Commodore William Corfras. Signal from HMS Caledonian, Commodore. They say the stories aboard, suited up and ready. Kruthers acknowledged the communication with a clear nod and eye contact. By my estimation, that makes us ready to go, he observed. Violent's captain, Commander Anthony Miller, nodded. I agree, sir. Signal the fleet to prepare to jump on my mark. It was pleased that it only took some five seconds before all ships ready to jump, Admiral, was called. Mark. Caruthers always felt cheated by the occasion of a jump. He would like to lurch or a little jolt or some tingling sensation, or even just a nondescript sense of something having happened. As it was, the only indication that anything at all had changed was the way his operations display began to populate itself. The untrained eye would have seen only a mess. Caruthers, however, had a very trained eye. The seven ships of his task group had translated through their wormholes and landed some 10,000 kilometers from capital station. Far enough away that their minuscule signatures would be easily missed, close enough that the EM spectrum latency shouldn't throw off their targeting or electronic warfare. As they arrived, HMS's Violent, Vigilant, Victory, Vendetta, Vanguard and Viceroy each quietly released their passenger contingent of six BAE Terrier unmanned space vehicles. Car-sized lozenges of thrusters, sensors, and electronic attack modules designed to multiply their mothership's electronic superiority and obscure the fleet's exact size, composition, and position. The result was an immediate widening of their sensor net, and the hunters weren't bothering with subtlety. Even on passive sensors only, with the full group of seven warships and thirty drones deployed, he had an excellent idea of exactly what they were dealing with. 
Capital Station was a white, glass and chrome broccoli floré, 20 kilometres long, ending in a tangled route of rust brown mooring gantries and docking bays. Describing a rough sphere around it with a radius of some 500 kilometres was a swarm, consisting of literally thousands of ships, including 50 or 60 which were a match, in terms of tonnage at least, for Mimidin and Caledonia, both of which were by far the most massive ships in the human fleet. And they did not, fortunately, appear to be reacting to the arrival of the Death Orders. Dragon's Teeth out, he ordered. The Dragon's Teeth had been modified since the last battle at Simbreen. Their canisters were now filled with high-pressure air rather than using the explosives to disperse the mini-satellite jump beacons, allowing them to be deployed without creating an obvious sensor contact. Violence Hull rang as 20 such canisters were launched away from the ship on random timers, creating a friendly sphere of possible evasive jumps. At a range of 10,000 clicks and with the twin advantages of Surprise and Ewar on their side, the fleet was now well prepared to weather a sustained firefight. Signal the fleet, he announced. Ready, sir. Horatio. In the finest of military traditions, Horatio was a prearranged code phrase, meaning that the fleet should load a specific type of ammunition, calculate a specific firing solution, and await the second phrase, which would be the cue to fire. Carithers gave them the 30 seconds they needed. Nelson, he ordered. The answer from all six ships at once was an opening flurry of firepower, a two to three to one mix of gravity spikes, conventional anti-ship ammunition, and specialist ammo that would hopefully go unnoticed alongside the rest of the firepower. Simultaneously, the E-War opened up, strobing the swarm with dazzling mazes, and flooding every band they were broadcasting on with powerful white noise. Those gravity spikes were necessary. Without them, the hunter ships would just warp to point-blank range in the moment they were aligned along the correct vector, eliminating the human range advantage in an infinitesimal shaving of a second. The only counter to that was gravity spikes, delivered by timed explosion rounds that filled the intervening space with heavily distorted space-time, against which warp drives could secure no footing, ensuring that the hunters would remain firmly confined to subluminal manoeuvres. The free pass of conventional ammunition did their job equally well, however. Four of the larger swarm craft were crippled in the opening volley, spilling the contents of their pressurised bows, as the human guns thumped and hurled their payloads down a narrow warp channel, which dissipated mere centimetres from the target's hulls, allowing no possibility of evasive action. The swarm responded with animal speed, showing off just how efficient the hunter's cybernetic communications really were. All of those ships were behaving almost like a single amoeboid organism, spreading out and sending loose tendrils of high-speed ships creeping out and around, questing for a vector from which to try and warp the intervening distance and engulf or snare the outnumbered human task group. Several modes of light actually lifted off the surface of Capital Station, abandoning their tick-like burrowing in pursuit of the prized Death Order Quarry. Carothers allowed himself a satisfied nod. Signal Colonel Stewart, he said. Tell them they've taken the bait. Riley Jackson. Epic to group. The brace have engaged. All units, fold your witches and accelerate to combat speed. Riley practically swore with relief. The tension had been killing her, and she obeyed the order enthusiastically, punching Firebird up to speed and aligning for the station as hard as her sled could accelerate. Lucky knew the star to recoup their lost energy from the extreme long-range jump from Sol had swiftly gotten dull. She was a combat pilot, and Firebird and her sisters were combat space frames. They belonged in the melee. The wing reported ready. Stuart's voice had an eager edge to match Riley's own feelings. Epic to group, off we go. They jumped. Warping to the target station when the British ships had polluted its skies with gravity spikes, was asking for damage, which is why the opening salvo had included beacon rounds that streaked through the hunter formation and slowed to sublight velocities on the far side, inviting the TS-2s to infiltrate the swarm. The sky went from empty to being awash with red contacts, painted by the Royal Navy FOF and confirmed by the absence of friendly RFID. Fed by the combat controllers aboard Caledonia, her HUD indicated her assigned box and describing a cuboy some thousand kilometres long. At the kinds of speeds reached in Starship combat, she was sweet for a volume that large in seconds. Semenzo was reciting his E-War and weapons reports from only inches behind her head. Things had changed in the last couple of years. The missile payload was gone, replaced with electronic attack pods that further multiplied their forces' ability to blind and confuse the hunters. Only the Gow 8S remained for their onboard weaponry. A targeting laser speared one of the big ships as she raked his flank with 30mm rounds, shredding his shields. Behind her, Semenza grunted in satisfaction. Firebird 1, Fox 4. Rather than launching the missile, he summoned one. 
There was a stockpile of thousands back on Earth, and one of them jumped into the fight as Jimenez's call, existing on the battlefield for barely half a second before it slammed into the swarm ship and mauled it. Data point, the fuckers are armoured now, Semenza noted. He was right. In their last fight, that exact same class of missile had dismembered a ship of that size. Now it had merely gouged a ragged chunk from his flank. Hit it again. Well go, Firebird 1, Fox 4. The wounded swarm ship blinked out of existence, and Semenza's missile spiraled drunkly off into the black, too confused and low on power to select a new target. Data point, they can evade job now, Semenza added. An incoming contact became a cloud of gas and light debris, as Riley vectored sideways and put a cloud of 30 millirigter rounds in his flight path. His own railgun rounds went wide, barely 100 meters to starboard. Stay frosty, she muttered. Regari. The vent did two things for Regari. It saved his life, allowing him to walk, then crawl through the narrow ducting, unimpeded and unobstructed towards the hangar where the Gowian diplomatic yacht was landed. And it let him hear the screams. It caught and amplified them, so that he heard every one in hollow, magnified metallic detail. So many of them. Intermingled with the sounds of pulse gun fire, the flash and strobe of nerve junk grenades, and a new sound, a heavy explosive sound that reminded him of the action movies he had watched with Zhu years ago. But mostly screams. Screams of terror. Screams of pain. Dying squeals and pleading. Defined yells as some of the soldiers and security troopers went down fighting. Sometimes, when he couldn't hear the screams, he could hear the eating. Those were the worst. He hardly dared move at all in those quiet sections, for fear that the slightest sound would give him away. He had to inch past, treated to a full view of what exactly the hunters did with their prey. But his luck held. Either he was silent enough to not give himself away, or else they were so enraptured by their feast as to not notice. He crawled onwards. Owen Powell. When it came down to it, the difference between riding an outboard launch wearing a wetsuit and riding an extravehicular launch wearing an EV mass was basically that the latter was quieter. No waves, no bird call, none of the little noises that had hitherto masked every covert infiltration of Powell's career. Just silence, save for his breathing. The craft itself was little more than a conial bank of capacitors mounted on a kinetic thrust plate with latching points for the infiltration team and any heavy gear they were bringing to be attached and folded inside its little warp field. It almost looked like a black rubber launch. Across the huge distances involved, it relied on computer navigation rather than a pilot, so there was little to do but program it, hang on, and hit the button on the control screen at the little vehicle's nose. He had never felt so exposed in all his life. There was no jolt or anything. The inertial compensation provided by the warfield was too well tuned for that, but it was still jarring for HMS Caledonia to vanish from behind them, and the capital station, which had until now just been a nigh invisible glimmer of light, suddenly be there, right in front of them. 20 kilometers long and only 2 kilometers away. Technically, they were smack in the middle of the swarm of swarms, but at the scales involved, human senses were hopelessly inadequate for noticing that fact. Only the occasional streak of light across the stars, weapons fire, or a ship moving at 70 frame velocities hinted that there was even a battle raging silently all around them. If their stealthy approach was not stealthy enough, if the E-War that was theoretically blinding every sensor delicate enough to spot them wasn't, then the only mercy would be that their annihilation would be so instant and total that none of them would notice it happening. The last approach used cold gas thrusters rather than the kinetics. The launch was designed to have practically zero sensor signature after all. It had been a precision approach. They were barely 10 meters from the station hull, stationary relative to a large window, though the mirroring on the glass made it impossible to see within, only that the section was not lit. They detached from the launch and Powell turned a single gentle somersault to kiss against the hull, absorbing the last of his momentum with his knees, just as they had practiced in zero-g training so many times before. Breaching the glass was simple. Sterling and Highland hacked a simple square out of the glass with two simple swipes of their fusion knives. Air pressure did the rest, freeing the plate of glass out into space, along with a blizzard of small objects caught in the rush of escaping air. Legsy heaved himself through. There was a moment of silence. Clear. Powell hit the beacon on his belt, as the combat controllers propelled themselves through the breach, and an inky cuboid, nearly invisible in space, simply appeared without ceremony next to him. Divorced of its power source, the stasis field collapsed, and Warhorse, Baseball, Titan, Thor, Rebar, and Snapfire were hanging next to him. He let them through the hole first, and, once through himself, settled onto the deck in galactic standard gravity. The Deltas deployed a force field sill over the breach, and, at their nod, 
Lexi and Serling burst through the door into the corridor beyond, pushing past the hurricane rush of air that flooded into the entry room. Their SMG spat out their rounds with a noise that went right through Powell's chest. He was pleased to hear it. The sounds of vacuum had been getting to him, and any sound was welcome, even if it wasn't a pleasant sound. Shrieking alarms, wedding aliens, and the distant hammering of Hunter Pulse Fire, plus an unpleasant hissing. Apparently their force field wasn't as airtight as hoped. Right, let's get into an airtight compartment, he ordered. They vacated the room and sealed the door behind them. Ares raised his saw and fired a sharp six round burst at something, and Power suppressed some pride when he turned and saw that the kid had just bad his first hunter kill. He was in commander mode right now. He couldn't afford to be sentimental. Lexi, Highland, and Sterling took point, storming down the corridor and ripping into a knot of hunters that were tormenting a shuddering Gunavang. All five of the monsters were dead before they even knew they were under assault. The huge alien was in a bad way, bleeding horribly from where the hunters had bitten the flesh right off her living body. Burgess went to work, and Powell took a moment to evaluate their position. It was some kind of a common area, full of benches and tables, and the kind of alien-sized furniture that made good high cover for humans. Better still, there was plenty of room for the defenders to deploy their jump array. This is our spot, he announced. The Alpha of the Brood That Builds. Interest? A human alpha? The first we have seen. The Builder Alpha examined the perspective of the little insect-sized spy drone as it settled on the ceiling above the Death Order. The human infantry had appeared from nowhere, storming out of a supposedly empty room on the station's upper decks without warning. They might also have materialised in that room fully formed. Impossible, of course. But then again, that kind of stealth was only marginally more credible, especially from a species so technologically behind the hunters. This particular specimen was clearly in command, having started by thrusting its arm out to indicate where its subordinates should go and what work they should do, and now pouring over a diagram of that section of the station, directing the efforts of the other eleven. The Alpha of Alphas was clearly intrigued also, it had a much more complete view of the battlefield than the Builder Alpha did, ensconced as it was in a kind of command throne that was designed to interface with its neural augmentations, and greatly expand its ability to track and consider the situation. It had proven itself in battle against these humans, receiving only minor wounds at worst. Now it's proving itself as a commander and leader. Correction. Not just an Alpha, it mused. Observation. Notice the markings on their armour. There are three different Death Order broods here. Each fulfills a different role. This is an alpha of many brutes. It must be an individual of great importance. The Builder broadcast understanding and agreement. Fascination. Interesting that their brutes function together through division of duty, they commented. Inspiration. And that displacement device. The possibilities. Satisfaction. Observing that device in action alone has been worth this trap. The alpha of alphas agreed. Thoughtfulness, and the specialized behavior of their warriors can be translated to our own brews. This is valuable data. They watched the Death Order slaughter lesser hunters by the dozens for some minutes. The violence was almost intimidating, even from a close listening post far removed from the action. The lead team of three would enter a compartment, and every hunter within that compartment would be dead almost too quickly to fathom, cut down by withering volleys of disciplined firepower. There was an objective to it, though. They weren't killing for the sake of killing. Instead, every time the humans surged forward, it was to claim another little knot of surviving prey, plucking them from the hunter's grasp and securing the meat the opportunity to escape. Dozens had escaped already, most of them the important, high-value individuals whose deaths would have so demoralized the prey across the galaxy. Each dignitary that escaped to whatever sanctuary the Death Orders had established beyond their displacement array was a personal insult to the Alpha of Alpha's plan. Why they should do so was incomprehensible to the Alpha of the Brood that builds. Why would superior lifeforms put themselves in harm's way to rescue inferior ones that were not even the same brood or species? It sensed that there was no answer to that conundrum within the remit of engineering. For their part, the hunter's response to human weaponry just didn't seem to be giving them the edge that the builder had hoped for. The guns were just too heavy and needed to be held in too specific a way so as to avoid injury. If only they could capture a working example of the weapons the humans themselves were using. As they watched, a family of spindly blue prey were herded into the territory the humans had seized and vanished through the displacement device. Just behind them was the wounded large prey, actually being carried by two of the Death Walters. The Builder revised his estimates as to human maximum muscle strength upwards by several percentage points. Curiosity. Those two seem to prioritize the repair and evacuation of wounded prey, it noted. 
Contempt. Yes. While that is an obvious sign of weakness and wrong thinking, it will also potentially undermine our intimidation of the prey. The Alpha of Alpha's thoughts were tinged with anger at this damage to their propaganda victory. Suggestion. I submit that we have gathered enough data. Those humans should be eradicated, their displacement device salvaged, and we should capture that Alpha of many broods, the Builder proposed. It did not take the silence that greeted this idea for hesitation or contempt. The Alpha of Alphas had demonstrated its intelligence and cunning time and again. It was undoubtedly mulling the suggestion over, considering the merits and potential risks. Resolve. Agreed. It sent at last. I will deploy the strongest brood. Regari. Regari's luck ran out the instant he dropped into the diplomatic yacht's hangar. Only the White Crest training that the mothers would have so despised, had they known of it, kept him from dying the moment he dropped from the vent and onto the deck. He hadn't seen the three hunters feasting on a brother of Clan Farflight, but his pulse rifle snapped up and was frying the instant he saw them. Three solid hits pulled the one holding a bizarre long gun in a shock absorbing assemblage, and he dived aside, throwing down a shield stick to cover his retreat. Retaliatory pulse fire splashed against it. The latest generation, available only to white crests, could emit pulse fire from the defender's side, and he used that feature to return fire, killing the last two, even as their final pulse shot through his barrier. That had been too close. He turned to the ship and froze cold, realizing that the hunters had already crippled it, recognizing the fact that it was a possible escape craft. He had no way off the station. No. There had to be an alternative, something he'd overlooked. A crawling sense of paranoia made him look up. The Alpha dropped from the ceiling like something obscene from one of Zhu's movies and smashed his gun out of his hands. Half as big again as his subordinates and much more heavily augmented, it kicked him and Regari felt a rib jar painfully inside him as the blow flipped him through the air to slide on his back halfway across the hangar. Winded and injured, he still fought to find his feet, scrambling at his belt for his backup pulse pistol. That too was sat aside by the Alpha, which used his other hand to grab him by the scruff of his neck and lift him off the deck, feet kicking and dangling. He wouldn't have been Regari if he hadn't fought for every last second though. Down to just his claws, he raked the nightmare's face, crossing it two eyes and badly lacerating the flesh around a cluster of cybernetics that replaced three of the others. He replied by biting off his left paw, just above the wrist. It was an almost dainty gesture, and hunter teeth were so sharp that Regari was almost able to see it happen without feeling it. One moment it was his paw, the next it was a meaty morsel, frothing blood in the creature's mouth, crunching and splintering as the hunter bit through the bone to swallow what had once been a part of him. It laughed. There was no epithet in Gyori to describe how much he hated it for that. The beast gloated, saving his kill. He snorted nasal mucus and spat it into the creature's remaining eye, too proud to give it the satisfaction of fearing it. He hated it, hated everything it stood for, and his last thought was to hope fervently that it would choke on him. Instead, his head twitched to look over his shoulder, and it dropped him, bringing up one of those large long guns. Those guns were clearly heavy though, too heavy to respond in time. Its head exploded, painted a grisly surrey of meaty matter and cybernetic parts all over the deck, and the most glorious sight in the galaxy double-timed across the hangar, guns snapping from corner to corner in case of any lingering threats. By all the clans of Gao, an actual human, built like a bunker and faces in an armoured vacuum suit, laid in technology, but unmistakably a death welder. Nothing else could conceivably have moved so easily while carrying so much. You're late, he tried it, out of pure bravado. You're alive, the human replied, setting to work on the stump of his arm. Regari reached across to retrieve his pulse pistol with his remaining hand and holstered it. He was keeping on top of the pain, barely, and having that little task to focus on while the human stopped his bleeding by ejecting some kind of foam directly into the wound, which hardened and stopped the blood flow almost instantly, kept him from crying out from the agony and fainting. Come on, compadre, you're not getting out of here on that shuttle, the human said. He slung his gun around his shoulder and tied a smaller one from a belt holster. Tucked an arm under Regari and hoisted him firmly but gently off the floor. It was like being a cub again, riding on an adult's shoulders. The diplomatic quarters outside were exactly the kind of hell his imagination and sense of hearing had suggested as he crawled through the vents. There were bodies everywhere, many of them clearly cut down from behind as they tried to flee. Intermingled with them were hunter corpses, however, clearly fallen where they had been feasting, many still with dripping shreds of flesh caught in their fangs. Two more humans in those armoured vacuum suits were firing stubby little black weapons at something for a doorway. Not missing a beat, his rescuer dropped his shoulders and surged past their firefight, shielding Regari with his own body. This brought him into view of another human, 
just in time for a Gary to watch him sidestep a charging beta and punch it so hard in the side of his jaw that the head was all but torn off. The huge corpse crashed into the bulkhead and left a purplish bloodstain. Where? Regari began. He made it no further than that, because an explosion, an order of magnitude larger than anything that had previously rocked them, punished the deck. The lights died, and artificial gravity went with them for just a second before the damaged control systems found an alternate power source for them. Emergency lighting, dark and blue, at least robbed the carnage of his more stomach turning hues. The humans clearly heard an order via some means he wasn't party to, because all of them began to fall back under fire towards the recreational concourse. The one carrying him picked up his speech at the point where Regari could feel a breeze in his fur. There were hunters on the concourse, but unlike any that Regari had ever heard of. Gone were the usual crew cybernetics. In fact, gone were whole limbs, and in place of the natural, sickly white of hunter flesh was a horrible wet, meaty redness which bulged and pulled in grotesque ways as they moved. Whatever these hunters had done to themselves, and granted them the strength to move confidently and swiftly, even layered in thick armour plates, while carrying large weapons. They were huge, as big, if not bigger than the Alpha that had nearly killed him, and moving with such a sturdy, graceful precision that was more like a human's motion, and these ones seemed to be handling their guns just fine, pouring a hell of firepower into the water feature that three more human soldiers were using for cover. His rescuer's gun hand came up, and the pistol's sharp crack was a very different noise to the heavy, explosive, industrial thunder being made by the hunter weaponry. Unlike them, his aim was sharp and precise. One of the abominations choked and collapsed, as the rounds ripped into exposed gaps at the sides and flanks, but two of his friends turned to face the new threat, with bullets sparking off shields and armor plates as they returned fire, screening against the glare from the bright light mounted below the pistol's barrel. Regai was jolted badly when his carrier then jinked into cover, and he was let go of. Even if the human was trying to be gentle, being carried by a death order was clearly a dangerous experience. He shook his head down. There was more gunfire, shouting. The deck plating shook. They're coming up the left! They're fucking suicidal. Baseball, rebar, get up on the right there. The deck plating dented under their weight as the pinned free dashed from where they'd been hiding and made it into cover beside him. Good shooting, Hoss. Anybody hurt? I took a hit, didn't penetrate. It was guns of theirs hit hard, though. Watch the ones coming down the middle. Fuck, nerve jam! Oh no, you don't. Regari felt like an icicle was pounded into his brain as a grenade went off nearby. Man down! Get him back here, suppressing fire. A storm was shooting. Heavy footfalls, more shouting, and something large was dragged into cover alongside him, one of the humans convulsing and twitching in his armour. They're still coming. Throw a grenade. Frag out! An explosion that left Izzy's ring in protest. Station damage, alarms, started wailing nearby, adding to the chorus of violence. How is he? He needs to be jumped to triage right now, sir. There was a deadly, horrible pause. Falcon, can we make the array? I don't think so, sir. Thor, demolish it. We EA jumping. Major, he's dead, sir. Aye. Grab the ETs and fall back, that way. Legsy, Highland, cover the retreat. Regari was hoisted up with Defoe to strength and carry it. There were three others with him. A Corti and two Kuglu, who seemed to be equally as petrified by their rescuers as by the hunters. He could see over his carrier's shoulder as they ran. The one in charge paused long enough to tap some commands out on the computer he carried, and the dead soldier's armour started smoking, then burst into flames. The one carrying him muttered something. His helmet decided that the sort of Vosse delivery was not intended for translation, but Regari understood just enough English to understand him. Goodbye, Sterling. Get in this bag, quickly now. The court he was clearly one of the political delegation, and not accustomed to taking orders gracefully. What exactly is an EA jump, and why am I being stuffed into a bag for it? He demanded. The human commander clearly had no patience with courty games. It means exo-bloody atmospheric. We are going to jump out of this station and land on that planet, so put on the fucking bag, he snapped. Behind his pressure helmet, his eyes promised trouble the likes of which no alien could comprehend if he was not obeyed. The court he squeaked and practically dove into the bag. Regari had already been mostly into his, but he bought upon hearing this. Jump? The human whose chest the bag was strapped to nodded and pushed him down gently but firmly, helping him curl up inside it. Yep, he said. Is that safe? Hell no. He's been eaten by hunters, though. He turned the bag over Regari's head and sealed it. It instantly pressurized, filling the sweet atmosphere there was a welcoming relief from the meat-tasting foulness he'd been breathing. There was a little transparent window for him to see out of, and through it he saw two of the humans each stick a large brick or something to the outside station wall. There was a muffled speech, then shouting, as the humans who had stayed behind retreated into the room, still shooting. They slammed and sealed the door, and an instant later, 
A titanic detonation shook the room. Claremore? The commander asked. Yep, there's more coming, but they're being careful now. Right, last seal check. Blow it on my goal. The humans scrambled to check each other's suits, and all loudly declared them satisfactory. Then the one carrying him turned away and hunkered down and... Losing his hand turned out to be only the second most violent thing that happened to Regari that day. The first was any station dweller's nightmare. The total catastrophic failure of an outside wall, and the resulting depressurization that flung them and everything else into the room, out into space. Crushing G-forces caused him to black out for a second. Hey, hey, you still with me in there? The voice was coming from a small handheld device attached by a cord wire to the same panel on the inside of his bag that was providing Regari's breathable air. Tinny and quiet as it was, it still seemed loud inside the bag, which was basically silent apart from the faint sounds of the air being exchanged, and of Regari's own body. He grabbed it and tentatively pressed the button on the side. Yes, I'm still with you. Good news, man. We're alive and re-entering just fine. Regari had to produce a bitter chirp at that one. Oh yes, everything is absolutely perfect, he commented. Better than being eaten. What's your name, compadre? Regari. Officer Regari of Clan Whitecrest. Cool. Call me Warhorse. Regari pushed his nose up to the window of his bag, which was now a taut cylinder. He could just make out the human's arms on either side of him, and beyond that, only Capital Station and Tumbling, Burning Lights. Warhorse sounded more like a codename to him than the human's real name, but he wasn't going to argue. Goodness knew he'd gone by plenty of assumed identities in his duties. So, atmospheric re-entry without a spacecraft, he said. I assume this suit of yours is equipped for it? Technically, everything about this suit is so classified I can't tell you shit about it, man. But you know, you'll figure it out if it is or isn't by the way we do or don't burn up, Wars told him. How comforting. Huh. They fell in silence for a while. There was a pale blue glow just building up past the limb of Warhorse's limbs when Regari finally spoke. I'm curious. Why? Why what, man? The Dominions treated you. He spoke in English as best as a Gary mouth could, like shit. You lost a presumably elite soldier today. One of the very fucking best, Warhorse agreed. There was an emotional edge to his voice, but Regari couldn't interpret what that edge might be. Not that it was difficult to guess. Not to belittle his sacrifice, he said carefully. But why? Hey, I don't know the why of it, man, Warhorse replied. But my whole thing is saving lives. That's like my job, my purpose in life. So I'm just doing what I do, you know? You lost a man, Regari repeated. Yeah, and I'm going to miss him like crazy. He was one of my brothers, man. But we saved like, what, 50, 60? That many? Something like. Still, risking 12 elite human soldiers to save 50 or 60 ungrateful politicians. A life is a life, man. Doesn't matter if it's human, Gawian, Kumbru, or that little grey fuck on baseball's chest. There was a flicker of orange light. Reentry plasma? Yeah. Force will just handle it just fine. Sit back and enjoy the fireworks. Ah, fireworks. Regari nodded. I had a human friend once. She showed me video footage of fireworks. I always thought it would be fun to see them. Human friend? Sure. The translator spat out Warhorse's response in the form of the Gary word for footwear, with a questioning uptick. Her real name has this awkward sound at the start, like shh, but more buzzing. Wait, not Jew? You had a Jewish friend? I don't know what that is. Her name was longer and flatter sound. She said she was Chinese Canadian? Ah, right, gotcha. Yeah, most other humans struggle with Chinese names too. The plasma outside was now a steady orange torrent. The bag's window was clearly photosensitive, because it had darkened to Welder's mask black in order to protect his eyes from the contrail's incandescence. Then the shaking started. Is it meant to do this? You got me, compadre. This is the first time I've done this. Not even in training. Too dangerous for training. Hold on. Regari curled up, resisted the urge to let his claws out and shut his eyes, wishing against all rationality that he could be a cub again as he and Warhorse became a fiber together and fell. The eternity of being about to die ended in a metallic noise, the wheeze of cloth against cloth, and a jolt nearly as violent as the one that had flung them from the station. What? What was that? he asked. He hadn't thought to press the button on the communicator, but now Warhorse's voice came through to him from outside the bag, slightly muffled, but no more than that. They had atmosphere. Parachute. Worst pass over, compadre. We're almost down safe. You okay? What's left of me is doing fine. Bueno. Last hit coming up in three, two. Regari grimaced as there was a thump and several jolts, before the human fell down backwards, careful to let Regari fall on top rather than the other way around. There were some more metallic clinks, a rusting of fabric, and then the top of his back tore off. Warhorse looked in. You okay? he asked. 
Regari climbed out of the bag as best he could, with only one paw and collapsed on his back, gulping like a strand of fish. I never want to do anything like that ever again, he stated. Warhorse just lay beside him and chuckled. The chuckle turned into a laugh, and he surged to his feet and ripped off the helmet and mask of his pressure suit, revealing a stubbly fuzz of head hair on deep nut-coloured skin. Still laughing, he threw the helmet high into the air, and shrugged off the parachute harness and rucksack, and then spread his arms and howled. The noise was agony. A primal roar of defiance aimed at the universe which impelled Regari's sensitive ears and straight through into the pain centres of his brain. Warhorse seemed to have gone mad, jumping and swearing and punching the air, always returning to that same WOO sound. Regari watched in alarm as the human did a double backflip in what must to him have been extremely low gravity, then stood, ripped a stone from the turf that was as big as Regari's head, and rode hard at a nearby tree before collapsing, giggling on his back. The stone hit the tree with such incredible force that it lodged in the wood. A second later, creaking, crackling, hissing and groaning, the tree fell over. Warhorse's laughter died and he sat up. Jeez, he said, did I do that? Regari scouted him. This is the only known Class 2 planet. You're a native of a Class 12. You could probably ruin this planet's whole biosphere by just breathing on it if you aren't careful. Warhorse blinked at him, then stood up. Didn't catch one word of that, man. He looked around. Where the fuck is my helmet? Regari picked it up and offered it to him feeling his whole arm wobble from the weight. Thanks, man. Warhorse wriggled it back onto his head, muttering angry to himself. Fucking amateur it is. Don't be stupid. Never remove your helmet, dumbass. I said, Regari repeated, when he was back on and the translator was working again. Now, we're standing on the only known Class 2 planet in this galaxy and you're from a Class 12. You could do serious harm if you're not careful. Shit. Warhorse nodded in agreement. You're right. Sorry. You better not do that either or you'll definitely kill this world, Regari added. I know, man, I live on Simbreen, Warhorse told him, twisting the helmet back and forth until it was firmly in place and the docking collar re-engaged with a solid snap. He checked it was seated properly by throwing his head back and forth a bit and wriggling his shoulders. Thanks for the reminder, though. How heavy is that helmet? McGurry asked. 25 pounds base weight, Warhorse replied, which, yeah, sucks. He rearranged some of his equipment and trod the ruck on again, as if it was nothing, causing McGurry's boggling over the helmet to intensify. He had experienced for himself just how strong Zhu had been, but between the stone, that rucksack, and the easy way he had carried Gary himself, and all that other gear back in the station, it was plain that Warhorse vastly outstripped her. The human pressed firmly on the side of his helmet. Stainless, Warhorse, he announced. Arrived EZ. One healthy ET in tow, I'm at, uh... He checked the device in his hand and reeled off a string of numbers. Seeking cover and awaiting orders. There was a silence for a few seconds and then... Warhorse, Stainless. I have your DZ. Seek cover, rest stop. Turn to Tacnet 3904 Tango November Juliet. And await further. Out. Warhorse grunted and looked around, scanning the horizon with those predators' eyes. There, he pointed. Regari squinted and could see the shimmer of water cascading down the rocky outcrop, carving a little tree haunted valley. How far is that? he asked. Eh, yeah, three clicks or so. I joke further than that before breakfast. Ah, yes, human endurance running, Regari sighed. I'm going to slow you down, aren't I? Nah, man, climb on. Regari flattened his ears disbelievingly. You can't be serious. Gravity this low, I need something to weigh me down, Warhorse replied. Besides, what you mass, like 90 pounds? I can lift you one-handed in twice this gravity, no problem. The translator fed him a Gary measurement that sounded about right, so he nodded, imitating the gesture he'd often seen Zhu use. Warhorse just returned the gesture and waved a hand towards the pack on his shoulders. Regari paused. Then twitched his whiskers resignedly and did as the human suggested, clambering up the bat to sit atop it. It wasn't dignified, but Warhorse didn't appear to notice the extra weight. Man, we should put a machine gun up there for you or something, he chuckled. How about optics or that map of yours, Regari suggested. Good thinking. Binos are in that front pocket there. Warhorse handed up the map device. It was alarmingly short on detail and Regari said so. Warhorse just nodded. Relax, Intel's got our back. We'll have a better map pretty soon. They headed out. Warhorse quickly settled into a steady rhythm of big, long bounding strides that ate up the ground and just kept going. It wasn't quite running, so much as a vigorous, fast march, and it was deceptive. Regari wouldn't have guessed they were moving very fast, but when he glanced behind them, he saw that their landing site was already distant and receding. He played with the binos, adjusting their width, having to set them to their widest to fit his own face, but once he did so, and toyed with the wheel on top and his functions, he swiftly got the hang of it. It was strange. Handling a piece of human technology, made by humans for human use. It certainly didn't feel like a lower tech species gear, either. 
It may have lacked a few of the advanced features that he'd have found in a Garin equivalent, but optically it was superb. The only real burr in his fur that he could find to complain about was the heaviness. Warhorse wasn't even breathing heavily when they stopped again. Regari chittered a little on the surge of cynicalism. Their resting spot was as stereotypical of a low-class world as could be. A gentle glade fed by a clean, bubbling stream with a pool in which slender, silver little fish were undulating. Idyllic. Warhorse ignored it. Instead, he let Regari off his back and shucked off the ruck before examining the dressing of Regari's arm. Any pain or itching? he asked. No, but it feels like the paw is still there, Regari said. It was a strange sensation. He could still grip and move his fingers, but of course nothing happened. Except that what was left of the muscle sheath in his forearm twitched pathetically as he tried to flex and twist to pull on the now absent tendons of his now absent paw. He sat down and stared at the dressing, as Warhorse made a satisfied noise and pottered about, setting up a basic camp. You okay? He was asked after a while. Regari chirped a bitter little laugh. I'm supposed to be one of the elite, he said. Clan Whitecrest, foremost commanders and security specialists of the whole Galleon species, but next to the hunters. I may as well be a cub. Next to you? Warhorse had set up next to the pool and was digging for his bag. Nah, man, you're a fucking badass, he replied. What was that expression? Pull the other one? Only, please don't, because I'd like to get off this planet with at least three whole limbs. Totally serious, compadre. What did you do to that hunter? Clawed out two eyes and spat in the third? And that was a fucking alpha. You got spirit, bro. Regari snorted. Spirit doesn't count. Only results matter, he snapped dismissively. You got the result, though, Warhorse said. When Regari twitched a disbelieving ear at him, he nodded insistently. Seriously, you were alive. You heard it long enough for the cavalry to reach you, and you saw that son of a bitch dead. Result. You're just trying to pet me up, Regari told him. Warhorse nodded. Of course I am. Best way to do that's with the truth, though. You're still kicking, it's not. And the difference was you going down swinging. Spirit gets results, man. Regari sat silently and watched. The human soon made a satisfied noise and pulled out a handful of flat brown packs of some kind and scooped up some water from the pool in a little bottle. There was a pump of some kind in the bottle's end, and after a few enthusiastic strokes of that, the water was forced back out through the filter nozzle. Are you? Filtering and purifying that? Regari asked. This is a class 2 planet, you don't need to... Basic survival rule where I'm from, never trust the water. We're not on where you're from. Warhorse paused and shrugged. Eh, a good habit's a good habit. He held up the little brown packages from the ruck. Hungry? You're eating now? We only just landed. Every chance I get. Never know when the next opportunity is going to arrive in a situation like this. But how are you going to cook it without a fire? If you build one, won't the hunters... Relax, we got that covered. Besides, there's a long way to go ahead of us. I'm going to need the nutrition, whereas the hunters only might come looking for us. Oh. Well, I do like human food. Yeah, this is just an MRE, not fine dining. Kind of the tastier alternative to those ration balls, Warhorse said, opening the package and tipping most of the contents out onto his lap. He tipped a little sachet of white powder into his bottle and shook it, turning the water a vivid pink, then took off his breathing mask and sipped it. What's that? Regari asked. Juice, electrolytes, sugar, hydration? Warhorse sipped again and licked his lips, frowning. Supposedly it tastes like cherry. Supposedly? Look, you want one of these to try? Because I can eat whatever's too much for you. If it's safe. It's all been treated with gamma radiation, man. Totally sterile, I promise. Then, yes please. Warhorse nodded and examined the available options. I warn you, man, this shit's... This is the high-performance version. It's meant to get a fuckload of energy into me first and foremost. The culinary experience is... Like a distant second, he pointed out. I'll try it anyway. You're right. Nutrition in a situation like this is important. Warhorse nodded, and stuffed the rest of the MREs back into his pack. Damn right. He ripped the top off a couple of transparent plastic bags, slid the unappetizing green pouches of food inside, and then added a little water before returning the bags to their cardboard box and leaning them against a rock. Within seconds, steam was rising from the boxes. How does that work? Regari asked. Chemical reaction. Clever, Regari commented. No flame, no smoke, minimal heat signature. That's the idea, Wars agreed. Regari watched him cook, suddenly calculating how to eat his meal one poured. His nose twitched involuntarily when Warhorse needed a little sachet and had spread the off-white paste it contained onto his dry crackers. The scent thus unleashed was creamy and rich, hinting that his dismissive assessment of the meal's quality had probably been unfair. Sadly, when Regari sampled the crackers while waiting for the main course to be ready, 
He was sorely disappointed, and Warhorse was right. While the beverage was clearly supposed to taste like fruit, what it mostly tasted of was chemistry. What's this? he asked, opening and sniffing it. The scent was pungent and sugary. It's called a hua bar, Warhorse said. I wouldn't, man. That thing's got like a thousand calories in it. The translator paused while translating that figure, but Regari could see why. It must have been doing an internal error check to make sure there wasn't some mistake. That was half a week's nutritional intake for a Gowian male. That many? Yep. Warhorse took the bar off him and bit into it, chewing vigorously. Give your Jorah workout too, he added, around the mouthful. Exactly how many calories do you need? Regari asked. Me, on a light day? At least 10,000 or so, Warhorse replied. But this is going to be a really active day, so a lot more. Anyway, main should be ready. Between a small rock and leaning against the bag against what remained of his left forearm, Regari was able to hold it steady enough to poke at it with the spoon. While it suddenly looked appetizing enough, his nose was practically being overwhelmed by the rich scent. He tried it. One mouthful was enough. Great father phew, he coughed. Warhorse just laughed. You okay? It's like eating a candle. Like I said, man, performance first, pleasant eating experience second. Don't worry, you're going a pretty good go for an E.T., he said, ripping his own bag open and mixing in the contents of a tiny glass bottle of red sauce. Regari licked the sauce out of his fur, regaining his composure. E.T.? Extraterrestrial. It's a funny way of saying non-human. You have other ways? Sure, E.T. is friendly. Non-human is all formal and proper, and Xeno is an insult. Warhorse inhaled most of his meal in three efficient scoops. This human friend of yours, he said, around the mouthful before swallowing. Jew? Close enough. How'd you meet? There's not a lot of us out here. She and abductee? McGarry made an affirmative ducking nod. Yes. About 11 Gary years ago now, one of our settler transports was raided by mercenaries working for an... He raised his paws and made a finger quotes gesture that Xu had been fond of, only realising that the effect was spoiled a little by his missing paw after he'd done it. Unauthorised researcher. He snorted. So the courty director claims, anyway. They killed all the males and abducted the females and cubs. Warhorse's expression darkened, even as he leaned over and stole Regari's leftovers. Corno de madre, he snarled. The translator didn't seem to have a readily available equivalent, but the intent was clear. Shu was picked up separately, but kept in the same holding cell, Regari continued. Thanks to her, they were able to escape. Where do you come in? There was... political fallout. Aima, the leader of the abducted females, fought Fang and Claude to get Shu adopted into the clan of females. Most of the other females sided with her, of course, but some of the male clans. Yeah? Warhorse took another mouthful. I thought you guys mostly went along with the females. Regari chittered. I thought you guys were dangerous to seize ridden predators, he countered. Granted, many of the clans are ruled more by their testicles than by their brains, but the females don't hold absolute power, just a strong influence. They may hold the veto, but they still want to mate as much as the males do. Warhorse chuckled again. Yeah, that sounds about right, he agreed. What did you think? I didn't. I was too focused on the boat of my career. Your career? Regari made an uncomfortable noise. It's complicated. I'm a medic, compadre. I can handle complicated. Regari wobbled his head sideways in a fair enough gesture. I have some disagreements with the clan, he said. This was early in our negotiations with the Dominion, and I was part of the inquiry into the missing transports. We had all the circumstantial evidence we could have wanted that proved there were Dominion species involved, and that this unauthorized research was anything but, but nothing concrete. Meanwhile, I found out that the Whitecrest clan and several other powerful clans were all preparing as if our membership of the Dominion was a foregone conclusion. Buying shares and equipment, training and indoctrinating our new brothers a certain way, that kind of thing. You suspected corruption in your own ranks? Warhorse guessed. No. I wasn't so cynical back then. I was appalled, of course. As far as I was concerned, even circumstantial evidence that the Dominion was involved in our transports going missing, and complacency is collusion, as far as I'm concerned, was the reason enough to abandon negotiations on the spot and approach the Celsius Alliance. Of course, now I know that the Alliance is just as bad, but... He shook himself. Rather than discussing the matter with some of my more seasoned brothers, I took it straight to one of the fathers, convinced that it was an honest oversight, and that when they saw the evidence we had gathered, the mistake would be corrected. Bad move? The father I approached was one of the... Um, quiet conspirators. Not one of the obvious beneficiaries of the deal, but still very much involved. And who stood to gain. What happened? He promoted me. Warhorse paused in pouring the last of the gravy into his mouth. Come again? 
to the rank of White Crest Attaché to the Mother Supreme, part of her executive staff, and if need be, her bodyguard. A prestigious career move on the face of it. The reality, he sniffed. Warhorse just sat and listened, so Regari pressed on. The reality was I was now not involved in the investigation, was no longer part of the clan's decision-making process, was a pariah in the inner circle, and though I theoretically had the ear of the Mother Supreme, actually using it might have been seen as meddling in female affairs, which would have politically and reproductively ruined me. Lady clawed you. Regari winced. The turn of phrase was intimately disturbing for Gallians. That's an accurate description, he conceded. Warhorse nodded his understanding, starting in on the second hoorah bar. Regari shook his head in disbelief. What do you have in there? A black hole? So what happened? Warhorse asked, ignoring the jab. Regari grinned, emulating the human gesture. Shu did. Date point. Ten years earlier. Twelfth day, A.V. Yeiwa City, Wiko Yuan Province, Gao. So why are you bring this to me, and what is it? Kanoru's ear swilled uncertainly. Security footage from the courty facility those females escaped from, he said. Regari's own ear signaled his scepticism. I'm not involved in the investigation anymore, remember? He pointed out. Vavataru saw to that. This is... relevant. We may need you to, uh, influence the Mother Supreme. Regari's ears flattened. This footage had better give me a compelling reason to do so, he said. You've heard that the leader of these escapees, Aima, is petitioning to have the alien recognized as a sister? Regari dot his head. Yes. This is the footage of that alien in combat. They watched it. The alien was very definitely alien long of limb, compact of body and remarkably poised, but it wasn't until she almost ripped one of the Loikal jailers in half that the source of that poise became apparent. So strong, he muttered, watching as the alien darted across the room and practically flattened the second Loikal. We're still working on theories as to how biology like that is possible, Kenoru told him. Regari watched as the footage cut to the alien female cutting a swarve for an assorted grab bag of the galaxy's mercenaries. What's the best one? I'd bet five years of celibacy that the Dominion's assertions that death warriors can't support intelligent life is wrong, Kenoru replied. Plausible, Regari conceded. And terrifying, Kenoru continued. If I'm right, then that thing is a bomb waiting to explode. Is she? Look here. She's fighting differently now that she's figured out the strength disparity. Regari slowed down the footage to point out the subtle changes in the alien's fighting style, wounding rather than killing, showing restraint despite not having a reason to. I'm sure its compassion will be a great comfort when the death or plagues it undoubtedly carries get loose and gow and kill millions of our people, Kanoa sniped. Billions, perhaps. Have any of the females shown signs of infection? No, none. Then you know what I see, brother. I see a poor pre-contact life form, who knows how far from home, and probably feeling very confused right now. Regari looked his brother in the eye, and I intend to say as much to the Mother Supreme. You defy our clan fathers a second time? What would they do, crown me Emperor of Gao and call it a punishment? Regari scoffed. Kunuru growled. There was a flash of teeth before he restrained himself. In older and less civilized times, that would have inevitably led to a snapping, claw-bearing fight. Your own brothers and fathers, he began, are wrong, brother. Regari interrupted, ejecting the little crystalline data wafer that Kunuru had brought him and boxing it. I'm lord to the clan, but that doesn't mean I have to agree with the fathers automatically. You do have to obey their orders, though. Regari's ears pricked. They're ordering me to influence her? He asked. Well, no, not ordering as such, Kanoru backpedaled, and with good reason. The whole clan's mating finesse would suffer if the females felt that Goyme was being bullied by the White Crests. And then I shall use my best discretion and judgment, Regari asserted, just as the fathers trained me to. Date point. Tenth year, A.V. Planet Garden. Capital System. Dominion Space. You fought back, Warhorse observed. You're damn right I did, Regari said, spitting the English word. He couldn't see Warhorse's mouth anymore. The human had replaced his breathing mask and was reclining against a rock, but he saw the way the skin around his eyes and face stretched and wrinkled. There was a smile under that mask. Dude, you're fucking scrappy. I like it. Regari didn't get the chance to respond as the radio chose that moment to flare. Operation Novahound, stainless. Our evacs arranged, so your tablets for RP Alpha. You have five hours to get there. Individual orders follow. There was a pause then. 
Warhorse, stainless. Your route to RP Alpha takes you near Thor's projected LZ. I can't raise him. Determine his status. Warhorse nodded. Though of course his commander couldn't see it. Stainless, Warhorse, he replied. Orders received and understood. Out. In the second the link was cut, he swore loudly. Me cargo and Dios. Ugari scrambled to his feet as Warhorse lurched upright. Is that? I fucking pray his radio's just out, Warhorse replied. He scowled at the intel tablet, looked around to get his bearings, then grabbed the rug. He diligently repacked it after they were done eating, and Regari winced the sheer weight of it as the human shrugged it on before stooping and offering him two linked hands for a step. Climb on. Regari didn't argue. Wherever RP Alpha was, it was nowhere nearby, and he would just need to rely on Warhorse's strength and endurance if he was ever to get out from under a thundercloud of hunters. Warhorse handed in the binoculars and intel tablet as soon as he was settled. Keep you on course, he said. HMS Violent. Capital System. Commodore William Corphorus. You're certain they're after you, Stainless. There was a delay in the response. With the strike team having made an exo-atmospheric exit from the station and abandoned the rescue operation, the fleet and space planes had scattered to extreme distance and gone dark. In practical terms, with each one being most likely alone inside a radius of several light seconds, they were impossible to find. Violent was nearly six light seconds from the planet now, and there meant plenty of time to wait for the photons of their conversation to wing their way back and forth. Completely, sir. Pa's voice was low resolution and distorted by distance and the audio compression, but perfectly intelligible. The weapons they fired at me looked like a rip-off of that oopsie whatever stone gun, but they were aiming the lethal stuff at the lads. They've got me paid for a commander, and they want to know what I know. We're prioritizing your extraction, Korothus decided. The anchor at DEFCON 2 right now, with the armor the hunters seem to be using right now, is the only sure way to secure orbital supremacy long enough to extract you. Stainless, your men are secondary to the objective of preventing your knowledge from falling into enemy hands. We cannot afford to give them any more inspiration. He counted out 12 seconds under his breath. Understood completely, Commodore. I also recommend that we ready an RFG strike to my suit beacon should my vital show up being incapacitated. Carothers turned to Violence Captain and raised a finger with a nod, indicating that it should be made so. We'll go at 1400 hours as per your recommendation, he said. Good hunting. Planet Garden. Capital System. Dominion Space. Regari. There, I see. Regari working the focusing control as best he could one poured. It's hard to tell. A dark patch that shouldn't be there that way. Warhorse glanced up and corrected his course, puffing like some ancient steam contraption from Gao's early industrial era. Regari lost sight of the anomaly as the terrain dipped, and when Warhorse pissed up the rise on the far side of that dip, Regari nearly fell off him because the human stopped dead. Oh no... Humans were so expressive in their grief. He'd seen him with Shu, and now Warhorse was projecting his sorrow even for a bulky suit of fully enclosed armour. He sat for a moment and then pushed forward, until they reached the edge of what was, unmistakably, a fresh crater. And the suit at the bottom of it was effectively intact, though it had been badly ablated by re-entry, blackened, melted, and burned away. From the contortion of the limbs and the crushed flatness of the torso, its operator had not survived. Warhorse sat down with a thump. Regari climbed off him, sketched a gesture of respect with his remaining paw, and let Warhorse grieve. The same shields that had allowed Warhorse and him to reach the ground safely had plainly failed in Thor's case, where it was never deployed at all. In either scenario, the suit had demonstrated that it was a hideously tough piece of equipment, having reached the ground and still recognisably been the same object. To fall from space and leave an impact crater and still be identifiable? Not a pleasant way to die but as a technical accomplishment it was daunting. He hadn't really considered what Death Order Engineering might accomplish before. Shu's intelligence and insightfulness had been obvious, as had her culinary artistry, but her sheer physicality and intensity had frequently overwhelmed those qualities, with the result that Regari had simply never turned his thoughts to humans as engineers, builders and inventors. He was still ruminating on the fallen suit when Warhorse moved, slowly raising his hand to the communicator on his shoulder. Stingless, he said, Voice thick with emotion. Warhorse. Thor is KIA. Airfield failure. Warhorse. Stingless. Copy that. Did the fill drop array he was carrying survive? Uh, that's a negative, Stingless. Warhorse. Stingless. Grab a momentum, mate. Destroy the suit and continue to RP Alpha. Out. Warhorse stood up again, then stepped down into his fallen commerce crater and ripped something from the front of the ruined suit. A patch of some kind. 
He did something Regari couldn't quite see and then stepped back as, again, the soup began to smoke and then burst into seething, angry flames. There wasn't much left to burn. The destruction was already pretty well total. Warhorse sagged and spoke to the charred thing in the crater. Fire Condius, brother. He knelt and gestured with Gari up onto his back again, shed the intel tablet, turned north, and marched. Warhorse was clearly in no mood for talking for most of the remaining distance to RP Alpha, wherever it was, and Regari let him work in silence. Instead, he pulled out his pulse pistol and, with some difficulty, thanks to his missing paw and the human steady gait, made a few tricky adjustments that he first learned when he was barely out of cupboard. He was becoming seriously impressed with the medical technology the humans had brought with them. His missing paw should have been a source of debilitating agony. Instead, it was a ghost, a phantom presence on his wrist that felt, when he wasn't paying attention, like the real thing. If nothing else, the anaesthetic in the dressing was highly effective. It was probably designed for death orders, he decided. That meant he was trusting the human not to have badly miscalculated and given him an overdose, but he was beginning to seriously trust Warhorse. His thoughts were broken by the communicator. Warhorse, long legs. I have eyes on your pal, but you've been stalked. Gary's first started crawling instantly, and he put a hand to his holster. Stalked, he asked. Don't look around, Warhorse told him. Long legs, Warhorse. Hunter? Reckon so. What are the big fuckers that got Sterling? See that stream to your left? Take a water break. Load it out in the open when it catches up with you. Warhorse looked left, and Regari did the same. The surface of the stream in question was an invitation all by itself, and he realised he was growing really quite thirsty. Will do, he said. Warhorse out. They paused. Regari couldn't sense anything amiss, but apparently Warhorse could, because he stood still, listening for a few seconds, then grunted and stooped by the water, unclasping his mask. Regari watched. Where he would have to lie in his belly to lap at the water, undignified and uncivilized to a modern Gowian, Warhorse just carefully put his gun slowly aside, ready to have it up and firing at an instant's notice, and dipped both hands into the stream to form a shallow bowl, which he raised to his mouth. Not filtering it this time? Regari asked. Appearances, Warhorse muttered, not actually drinking the water. He tilted his head slightly. Hear them? Hear what? Regari was interrupted by a pulse round, which glanced off Warhorse's upper arm. From the size and sound of it, it had been a heavy pulse, and the come with enough juice to fling humans about and break limbs. Sure enough, even the winging blow spun by the bulky death order around his axis and dropped him sprawling into the local grass equivalent. Regari's dive for cover saved his life. The bolt aimed at him would have reduced him to a nasty pink paste. Warhorse was up, though. Aside from knocking him around a bit, the pulse weapon hadn't apparently done anything at all to him, except make him angry. He returned fire, gun producing a heavy slamming sound that Regari could feel with each shot as a hammer blow in the chest. One of the hunters was torn to bits, dismembered by the firepower that ripped through it. The other, as Longlegs had predicted, was one of the big, grotesque, wet, red, naked musculature ones, and it was layered in heavy shield emitters that spat and flashed as Warhorse's bullets hit home but failed to penetrate. It lunged forward and Warhorse took a smart step away as deadly fusion edge talons raked out, nearly shearing off the end of the gun. The hunter was fast, nearly as much so as a human. Two pairs of those fusion claws swiped and slashed, and Warhorse survived only by throwing himself backwards and then scuttling away on all fours, staggering to his feet to gain distance. The hunter followed, and that would have been the end of Warhorse and Regari both had a lightning bolt of berserk and mountainous death order not erupted from among the shrubs without any warning. The hunter had just enough time to register the existence of this new threat before it head home, and after that there was no more hunter. Could have sworn you did better than that in training, pal, the cavalry declared, once the hunter was in several pieces. Both men extended their gloved hands and bashed them together. These ones are going to be trouble, Warhorse replied. I look out! The third hunter, another big one, had a cloaking device and a plasma gun, and that would have been the end of Longlegs and Warhorse both had Regari not shot it. The humans, in fairness, took the way that the beast disintegrated in a horrible slap of wet matter in their stride, and did a thorough check of their surroundings for threats, before turning their attention to Regari, who was licking the burn on his remaining paw, and kicking out the grass fire that was threatening to burst up around the glowing puddle that had once been his pulse pistol. Forking L, Bongs declared, but Warhorse scooped out some water and dumped it on the ruined gun, producing a fog bank and an angry hiss. The fuck was that? Regari licked his burn paw again. If you know how to rewire a pulse gun the right way, he said, then gestured to the nasty mess of former hunter that was swelling away downstream. You only get one shot, but better one shot that counts than a thousand that don't. The humans exchanged glances. I like this one, Orho said. I can see why, Longless agreed. We'd better get moving. They'll know where their mates were. Our best bet is to get to the RP. 
Right, let me just fix his paw. He needs at least one working. Oh, was agreed. Then turned to Regari. He grabbed something on his harness and the bag fell off. Clearly designed for quick release. Legsy, if you need ammo, check the pockets on the left side, he added. Warhorse's thick, armored fingers were strong enough to accidentally crush Regari's bones to powder, but his trust in the human medic was well placed. Warhorse's grip was merely firm, and he applied the dressing with paradoxical precision and delicacy, while Longlegs reported the contact to Stainless, and grabbed some of the offered ammunition. The process took only a few seconds before Warhorse stood and hoisted his bag back on. Okay, hop up. That'll do you for now. Let's go. Regari didn't argue. Right now, the safest possible place in the universe seemed to be Warhorse's shoulders. RP Alpha turned out to be a cluster of buildings atop a gentle swell on the ground. The Planet Garden was a park world, Class 2, with only the bare minimum of tectonic activity that was necessary for life to arise in the first place. It had no impressive rocky up thrusts or gentle slabs of broken crust resting at angles atop the layers below, only gentle swells and rolls and grassy hills. Ruins? Warhorse asked. This planet used to be the embassy world for all species, McGarry explained. Then the station was built, and because it's more convenient to dog with a station than land on a planet... Right. The humans paused to sip from their water supplies. The water was strangely coloured, like the instant juice had been. There must have been something in it to replenish them, McGarry supposed. Whose was this then? Lexi asked. I don't know, McGarry told him. My people are nearly as new to the galactic stage as yours, after all. Right, Warhorse repeated. Stainless, long legs. I have eyes on RP Alpha, 1ET and Warhorse with me. Long legs, stainless. Better get down here quick. We've spotted ground forces approaching from the north. Legs raised his binoculars to the north and nodded, before turning to Warhorse. Double time. Hold on, Scrappy, Warhorse said, and set off at an actual run. Regari turned his own borrowed binos to the north, and felt his hackles rise. They've got tanks? he asked. I've never even heard of hunter tanks before. Tanks we can handle, Lexi assured him, or rather the angels can. Mythical beings? Nah, mate, fucking spaceships. Lexi raised his own binoculars and examined the approaching hunter column as they jogged. Regari imitated him. Why aren't the hunters landing directly on top of us? Look up. Regari did so. Nothing much happened for some seconds. What am I looking... He winced and shielded his eyes as there was a tremendous flash in the sky. It faded almost instantly, but left a purplish-green blob of afterimage behind. Four. Our angels have got orbital superiority. Lexi's translated voice had a note of satisfaction in it. What's that? Tactical nuclear fusion warhead, Warhol spoke. He was laboring worse than Lexi, but then again he was carrying at least twice as much weight, and it certainly didn't seem to be slowing him down. If not for his heavier breathing and the sheen of moisture beating on his face, McGarry might have guessed he was almost finding the run easy. Righteous will be having fun, hey Lex? Do a fucking right he will. Nobody ever gets to play with the big toys. Fusion weaponry is not a toy, McGarry protested. It is when it knocks these big swarm ships out, Lexi pointed again. It was hard to see in daylight, but there were definitely distant bright trails describing stately lines in the sky. Wreckage, falling from orbit. They burst from the brush and shrub, and picked up the pace across the open ground around the buildings, pounding up the shallow incline onto a paved road surface. Legs of Warhorse, stainless, I see you. Third building on your left. Both men angled for it. Last in, Lexi asked, as they came to a halt in the heptagonal ground floor lobby. Eight other men were at work inside, taking the stairs for a to time in the low gravity, as they shuttled ammunition and equipment higher into the building. Nothing like a fucking courty in your back to make you want to get where you're going ASAP, one of the soldiers said. He and Warhorse exchanged one of those fist sam greetings. It all seems cool. He's cool as shit. Scrappy, this is baseball. Scrappy, my name's... Nah, -uh, man, we're on mission, Basil interrupted. We're using your war name. Scrappy seems like the kind of name you give a pet, McGarry protested. How about Dexter? Warhol suggested. With the arm and he's a killer brawl. The reference, and McGarry knew enough about humans to know that it almost certainly was a reference or an in-joke of some kind, went right over his head, but he decided that Dexter sounded much more dignified than Scrappy. It'll do, he agreed. As he suspected, the humans all grinned behind their masks, indicated by a creasing of their eyes. Dexter it fucking is. This human could only be stainless. He gave a guy an interested look. You think it's worth summoning Warhorse? He's a soldier, sir, Warhorse declared. Rad. If you're offering, mate, I need somebody in the window keeping an eye on the hunters. We've got a ranged marker at click out, a little bridge. Let righteous know when they start crossing it, okay? And Gary gave him a human nod. Can do, he declared. Stainless handed him a communicator. Press this bit to talk. It's made for us, so you're going to have to push pretty hard. 
Regarding squeeze it. As predicted, it needed some pressure, but he could do it. Stainless, Dexter. Communications test. Loud and clear, and translated too. Our revex incoming, but we need air and orbit superiority fast. That's what the hold up is. When I call, that is incoming. Head for the roof. Got that? Yes, sir. Good man. Warhorse. Tartan's rigging explosives along the north road. Resupply him. Legsy. Nick base will soar and get yourself set up in a ground floor window. Understood? Regarding Snepta. Yes, sir. It was identical to the two humans. They seem to meet everyone's approval. Good. Go. Firebird. Shuttles away. Escort form up. Riley swung Firebird onto the little ship's wing, and not for the first time, cursed that no Earth Corporation had yet produced a satisfactory craft, analogous to the role filled by the cheap, boxy models sold in their millions across the Dominion. It was a flying brick, space-worthy and air-worthy only by a dint of excessive reliance on its force fields. No jump drive, no emissions dampening, no nothing. If she'd had her way, they wouldn't be using them. She was going to have to use all the clouds she could muster to get that shortage fixed. They'd at least been able to slave the useless little thing's navigation computer to the network that allowed them to warp and jump in the vicinity of their own gravity spikes by shutting the traps down just long enough. Without that, the ground powders would have been fucked. They aligned, blink warped, and the planet capital went in an infinitesimal moment that contained nothing more than the suggestion of incomprehensible speed from being a night invisible turquoise dot on the infinite night to a great curve of blue and white that filled half the world Garland by smashed swarm ships. The bastards were fighting back hard, and they learned a few tricks, but she indulged in a grim smile inside her helmet, and knowing that they had lost only two TS2s in the battle, while well, hunter casualties must surely be numbering in the thousands. Righteous Firebird, she called. We're in your box. Firebird, Righteous, got an incoming heavy column down here. Line up for an RFG drop on my call. So there's a man Nico. Ooh, noise. I've always wanted to do one of those. Riley lined up, while her wingmen swept out to clear the box of any lingering hostiles. So have I, she agreed. Delight. Fusion weapons deployed via wormhole, too close to a fade. Exoesmeric deployment of individual ground units. And those communication ciphers? I salivate to sink my teeth into those. The Alpha Builder was broadcasting joyous paroxysms like a messy eater, spraying prey blood all over his fellows. The Alpha of Alphas radiated a good mood. He leaned forward slightly in his throne. Amuse Rabook. Continue to pay attention and you'll be fed further mortals, I am sure. These death orders are not stupid. They will have many secrets in reserve that they have not yet revealed, it declared. Regret. A shame that Alpha of Many Brews is going to escape capture. Query. You are certain? Assertion. It is the most likely outcome. They move with remarkable speed across terrain. Observation. The Brews are closing in on their refuge. The Alpha of Alphas gestured resignation. Dismissive, but we lack air and orbital control. There will be more death order surprises. I do not doubt that the cash will fail, but we will learn more from it. It snarled, bearing all of those vicious teeth. Anticipation. Every such secret gets us one step closer to devouring them. Dexter. Regari set down the binos and gripped the communicator's button for all he was worth. Righteous, Dexter, they're crossing the bridge. Dexter, righteous, copy that. You'll watch this shit and tell me how much it hurts them. Regarious fur rose a bit. The human combat controller's voice had been full of a kind of malicious anticipation, which was equal parts infectious and worrying. Righteous, Dexter, watch what exactly? There was a pause. Righteous was presumably busy. A few seconds later, he got back on the line. Dexter, you, sir, are lucky enough to have a front row seat for the first ever deployment of a rod from guard. Enjoy the show. Righteous out. Firebird. RFG dropped, some as a crowd. Riley hit the retros and shared his glee at watching a tungsten dipped steel bar the size of a telegraph pole leave them behind and streak down into the atmosphere. Shuttle escort, let's follow it down. Dexter. Regari first saw it as a star in the western sky. It hung there, low and proud drifting only a little to the north for nearly a minute, while a flood of hunters crossed the little bridge he had been watching. He had been wondering what was so important about that bridge, but suddenly he saw the genius of it. Those tanks could only cross one at a time. The star was drifting a little faster now. Then it wasn't drifting. It was a streak of light, a blaze of pure heat that... 
He averted his gaze just in time. But even so, the reflective flash off the back wall of the abandoned office he was sitting in was dazzling. When he looked back, he could see the ground settling back into place, and an expanding orb would display Sarah water vapor racing outwards. It knocked dust from the floor of the office, and shattered windows when it swept over them with a gut punch of pure volume that ripped an involuntary alarm cry out of him. The bridge was presumably gone, as was the road for hundreds of meters on either side of it, though that was mostly speculation on his part. There was so much dirt and smoke hanging where the hunter column had been, that had actually seen the bridge itself as a fantasy. When he surveyed it through the binoculars, all he could see was a beige cloud and a lone hunter, broken and dying in the road. He watched it expire, then put the binoculars down. His paw was shaking. Humans are crazy, he mutters. Alpha of the brew that builds. Epiphany. Of course. So simple yet so effective. No need for dangerous and expensive antimatter. No need to mine and enrich physical elements. Just drop a steel pole from orbit. Beautiful. The Alpha of Alpha strode to claw down one of the cables that connected it to the swarm. Observation. It seems... Crude. Insistence. Crude it may be, but Alpha of Alpha's greatest one. This is the weapon with which we shall destroy them. With the resources needed to build a single swarm ship, I can assemble enough leads to destroy a hundred cities. Satisfaction. Then this hunter served his purpose. I tire of it. We will intercept their shuttle and kill them. Begin the dismantling of the prey station. Meet to them all. Dexter. Something didn't add up, by Ragoe's reckoning. Nukes notwithstanding, the swarm of swarms was immense, and the hunters were always one step ahead of everybody's best when it came to cloaking technology. If there was even a ship there for the humans to detect and nuke, it was because the hunters either wanted it to be, or else they didn't care enough to hide it. Which meant that the humans didn't have quite the orbital superiority they thought they did. Which raised two questions. Why linger and lose ships? And why not just flatten the embassy combat from orbit? He exercised a little creative interpretation of his orders, and decided to keep watch out in other directions besides north. The hunters hit by the rod from God weren't going anywhere. Rikari has seen enough intelligence on Hunter Race to know that they were far from stupid. Quite the reverse. They had a uniquely sadistic cunning. Which was why he was able to save the team's lives. He was looking right at the dropships when they decloaked in the south on final approach. Hostile contact, south, he reported. Desperately squeezing the radio until his claws creaked. Deep below in the courtyard, he saw the Nova Hounds look up and south, then die for cover. In the opening salvo of core gun fire, the marsh of the street, therefore did nothing worse than punch some craters in the road surface and knock loose some masonry. The humans, whether by luck or incredible reflexes, escaped unharmed, though Snapfire's out of fabric suit ripped down his arm to reveal the armor scars beneath. Stainless, Dexter, looks like. 20 hunter dropships just decloaked 200 meters to ourself. They're landing to drop passengers. The column to the north still isn't moving, he elaborated. Stainless voice was tight, focused and precise. Roger. Nova Hounds reform the line, face south. Warhorse, get the ETs upstairs. Dexter, how many hunters? As many as 300, Stainless, Rigari told him. The dropships took off again, engines making a tooth grinding buzz as they angled up and over the roof. The Nova Hounds opened up a ripping volley of gunfire, which the hunters returned with interest. The street became a bilateral hailstorm of withering firepower, pockmarked with craters and fallen concrete, where the hunter core guns had blasted the architecture loose to create cover for the advance. Where are those dropships going? Stainless demanded. Regari calculated in his head, and felt his ears plaster themselves to his head. Stainless, Dexter, he reported. They're intercepting the shuttle. Firebird. Multiple bogeys, where the hell did they come from? Riley snapped right and spat two short bursts at the new contacts. Anything coming in like that was definitely hostile. Stay frosty. Righteous, Firebird, I've hostile aircraft on our approach vector. Repeat, bogeys in the box. We see them, Firebird. Plans unchanged. Let's call that shuttle. Riley threw them into a sideways drift to avoid a core gun round. Semenza, light him up. Semenza was proving his value again. His voice was as level and cool as a frozen lake. No missiles, boss. We're in Admo. He wore only for me. Shit, yeah. Call targets. Called. Warhorse. Rebar, low on ammo. I gotcha. The hunters were using something that looked like an old brain gun. Long barreled, slow to aim, and throwing a steady rhythm of fat, heavy bullets that would have hit like a train if they found their mark. Thankfully, the monsters didn't seem to know a damn thing about bracing or supporting the weapon correctly. I weren't strong enough to handle the kick. The human return fire, meanwhile, was savagely precise. Every time a hunter popped his head out of cover, it got blown away, 
and the cannibal fucks were losing half a dozen for every ten feet of ground they advanced, but there were a lot of them still upright and advancing, and the air was full of lead. Adam gritted his teeth as two alien bullets punched clouds of grey dust out of the concrete next to him, and dropped, skidding on the increasingly gravel-strewn asphalt to fetch up nets to Rebar, who sent his last magazine into his M16 just as he arrived. Good timing. Sure. Adam left him four mags and then was up and running, delivering ammo to Snapfire. There was no time to think. With no gun of his own, there was only time to keep the others fighting. Firebird. The TS2 spread out and last in, picking Hunter Strikecraft and filling the sky with ammo, but their Galway Air guns weren't really designed for dogfighting. Two hunters burst, falling apart in rains of flaming metal, but that left twelve more. The shuttle pilot was doing his part well at least. Every time the hunters drew a bead on him, he skipped out of the way, usually creating an opening for the TS2s, but he was under constant threat. Four more bogeys down, then a fifth. Riley gritted her teeth against the G-forces as she shunted a jolt of power through the thrusters, sweating away precious capacitor reserves and saving the difference by pulling it out of the inertial compensators, sending them skidding across the sky, rattling as they hit the thermal coming off the RFG's ground zero. Two bursts, two bogeys down, five left. Four left as Fire Dog rampaged past her, gun howling. The Swarm's technological superiority counted for squat when the human pilots had millisecond reaction times and could tolerate acceleration that would have killed their hunter counterparts. Shit, that one! Simmons' school cracked. Riley saw why instantly. It was on the Shuttle 6, and the Shuttle just didn't have the agility to pull off the evasive maneuvers that his pilot needed. Only one way to save the mission. Her vision grayed as Fireburn leapt forward in a lightning bolt of extra juice to the engines, drawing a groan for Zemenza. Then they sat on their instrument panels as she fired. The Hunter evaporated. The core gun round that would have killed the Shuttle instead took out Fiber's left wing. Stainless. Fallen Angel! Fallen Angel! Fireberg going down hard! Somehow, Jackson kept her sled level on spitting and stuttering yellow emergency force fields that spread out like the flaming wings of her stricken cross namesake. She fell in a glittering halo that lashed out and grabbed onto the buildings, bleeding off the hurtling wreck's momentum by gouging out torso-sized chunks of concrete and steel from the buildings. She still skidded half the length of the street once she hit, but the fields had done their job. She landed intact. Powell cursed and grabbed his communicator. Firebird, stainless, he demanded. Any survivors? The reply was a few seconds in coming, and came with a grunt of exertion. Stainless, Firebird 2. Two out of two survivors, but my pilot's leg is all busted up. Time was tight, but they still had two able-bodied PJs on the team, and the stricken TS2 was on the right side of the line at least. Dexter, status of that Hunter column. Stainless, Dexter. The clan still stopped at that bridge and reading for the orbital strike. Minimal threat. Powell had to admit, the Galleon was proving to be worth a few multiples of his weight in gold. Warhorse, baseball, secure that air crew. On it! The two young men probably handed off their cargoes to spare ammunition, and got up and dashed towards the downed space plane. Snapfire, Rebar, cover them. Titan, Legsy, fall back and defend the door. All four men grabbed their own packs and hustled, falling back in a disciplined pattern under fire, covering each other's retreat. That left only the combat controllers, who formed a rifle team in the ground floor window. Highland, who was up in the third floor window sniping the hunters wherever they tried to take cover, Dexter and Powell himself. CCT to the roof, he ordered. He touched the communicator again. Dexter, stainless, get to the roof. The Gavian sounding relieved. Yes, stainless. They were shouting from the door when the protectors returned, with Warhorse carrying Riley Jackson over his shoulder in a fireman's lift, trailed by her WSO. Her leg was a mess. Fly suit stained crimson around where it had been cut open and filled dressed. You've always got to be the center of attention, don't you? Power asked her, falling back on humor to cover his genuine relief that she'd not got herself killed. She managed a weak, bravado fueled grin and extended a fist, though she was sweating, shaking, and tight faced from pain. Good to see you again, Stainless. Looks like your boys turned out okay. Don't fucking thank me until we're home, he replied. Though he bumped her fist in return, then turned to Warhorse. Get her to the roof, mate. Yes, sir. More explosions sounded outside, punctuated by chattering gunfire. Rebar and Snapfire fell back into view, flying back down the road before ducking for the door. Titan was caught in open ground, and three rounds sparked against his armor, knocking him off his feet. As he tried to stagger upright, a fourth round hit and penetrated, and he collapsed, going around a hole in his abdomen. Powell didn't even need to give an order. Before he even had the chance, Baseball leapt into action, pushing the pitching arm for which he was aptly named to work, and hurling a frag grenade into the heart of the hunter advance with such force then it lodged in one monster's chest, knocking it off his feet, and sending the rest scattering for cover before it went off. 
He pounced on Titan and dragged him into the safety of the building, even as a burst of renewed firepower missed his head by inches before they made the safety of the doorway. Fortunately, the hunters weren't braving the saw yet, but that wouldn't last long at all. Much closer, and they'd be in nerve jam range. Stainless Highland. War hunter dropships to cloaking, north. They're mobbing us. Powell grimaced. Cease it is, where's that shuttle? He demanded. Stainless Starfall is on final approach, landing 20 seconds. Got a lot of hunter bogies coming in though. We need to be gone in one mic. It would have been nice if time had slowed. If he'd had a minute to think through the options carefully. But the decision was foregone. Somebody was going to have to stay down here and hold the hunters long enough for the shuttle to take on passengers and dust off. It was the kind of decision that Powell hated. He hated it especially this time, because his options weren't limited. There were no options. Both the CCTs were on the roof, Murray was three floors up, the two PJs had their hands full, and really, this was a job for a close quarters combat specialist. Well, that man was going to die. No maybe, no last minute rescue. He was ordering a man to his death, and there was only one right option, because the alternative was for everyone to die. He clamped down hard on his self-hatred, and gave the order. Dexter. The human shuttle pilot had nerves of steel, but Gary had to give him that much. Hovering level with a building's roof while aircraft thundered overhead was... He didn't have time to think about it further. Warhorse emerged with the roof access door, carrying another human in a fly suit, and he noticed him, gesticulating with his free arm. Dexter, get in the fucking ride! Regari scrambled in, squeezing as far as he could while the Corti, Kungru, and the humans piled in behind him. Being built to the scale of Dominion species, they still had plenty of room. But there was one missing. Even though the ramp was coming up and they were ascending. Wes? Stainless shot him a glare that could have eviscerated anybody in the shuttle. Then he leaned against the bulkhead, slid down it, put his head between his knees and his hands on the back of his head, and shook. Master Sergeant James Lexi Jones. He would have liked to go down shooting and hollering. There was no time for hollering. There was no time for anything. Just shoot. Just fight. Just buy them time. He'd taken baseball saw and fired it until the box was empty and the barrel glowing. That alone was enough. He saw the shuttle take off and streak into the sky. Mission accomplished. And then he fought with his SMG as he ran out of magazines. The last of the TS2 fighters jumped out with thumps of inrushing air, recalled once the shuttle was no longer in danger of being intercepted. And then he fought with his pistol until there were no more rounds to fire for honour. Then he fought with his knife. Then his fists. He held out long enough to still be standing when the second rod from God hit, sent to destroy the wreck of Firebird and his suit. The hunters didn't get the satisfaction of killing him. Admiration! The Alpha of Alphas generated a mental note of disapproval aimed at the Alpha Builder, but the lesser being was not paying attention. It had watched a lone death order fight a hundred of his muscle grafted experimental strongest brood warriors and arguably win. Everything from the biology to the weaponry, armor, and tactics spoke of wealthy fields of research to come. For a builder, there was no greater anticipation. If only that equipment had not been destroyed. Deference. If the Alpha of Alpha desires it, this one can begin work in the next generation of innovations immediately, as suggested. Blunt disinterest. Do so. The Alpha Builder pretended not to notice the emotional context. It simply stood and departed, already mentally preparing the calculations and experiments. Left alone in the dark and silence, the Alpha of Alpha was finally indulged in an unashamed broadcast of his emotional state, only once it was sure that there were no hunters within broadcast range. Admiration. Regari. The strangest part was that they recovered, and how. Caledonia's flight deck was different to how he remembered it. The shuttle set down with a half meter's clearance in the space otherwise filled by crates, equipment, workbenches, tool racks, and a structure of piping and plastic sheets in the corner. Medic stepped in, carting the two wounded humans away on Gurnis. Regari's amputation was examined and declared to be as clean and well dressed as if he'd had it off in an operating theatre. There was nothing to be done for it, at least not that was available on the ship. He barely paid attention. He was watching the Nova Hounds. Once out of the shuttle, they had been attended to by technicians, 
who helped them remove the outer layer of their suits, reading a variety of shades and brown and white skin, but uniform hair length. Beneath that was the armor. Guard metal scales that clearly formed the bulk of the suit's weight, as each man sighed a profound sigh of relief once they were off. The suits were taken away to be dismantled, serviced and cleaned, as a powerful mask hit Regari's nostrils. Each one of the Nova Hounds smelled of sweat, salt and exertion, and the dark grey bottom layer was black with moisture in several places. It was also, clearly, better than skin tight, as they had to wriggle out of it. War horses had worn through at the left armpit. He just snarled like an angry beast, grabbed it with his right hand, and tore the underlayer right off his body in a ragged strip. Regari blinked. He'd known the human was strong, but seeing what that shrimp looked like was something else entirely. It was almost ugly. Uncomfortably reminiscent of those red raw super hunters, he could almost see the strands and fibers of muscle under the skin. So many muscles. Bulging power in places Galleons didn't have places. They surprised him further by removing their garments altogether and then retreating behind the plastic screen for a shower. She had always been squeamish about removing her clothes, he remembered that. Even when bathing, despite being in the company of beings who biologically and psychologically couldn't find her attractive, and despite that Gowians viewed clothing more as being practical and useful rather than necessary, she has seemed to go to great lengths to avoid letting any more of her skin be visible than was inevitable. The Nova House didn't seem to care, though they did return from their appellations wearing loose, comfortable clothing. None of them had any kind of an expression. They just found an array of mats and blankets in the corner, and sat down upon them, still and silent staring at nothing. Before long, every last one of them had fallen asleep. Not long after them, Regari found a spot near Warhorse, curled up, and fell asleep himself. He woke to heat. It was stifling, humid and pungent in the flight bay, and his chest was already heaving and panting coolish air across his tongue before he woke up. Somebody was making simple music by tapping steadily on something, which made a hollow metal thump. Somebody else was syncopating it by tapping on two or three other things. Crates, equipment, the shuttle hull. There was an actual instrument involved, the twangy one that Shuha called a guitar. He didn't know very much about human music, but he thought he recognised a genre called blues. He sat up. Hey, wondering when you'd wake up? Regari stretched. Warhorse was sat next to him against the wall. He was putting what looked like pictures back in his pack. How long... Eight hours or so. Regari sat up more. I thought we were leaving capital, he asked. I was expecting to be in a Gowian hospital by now. Why is it so hot in here? We're in low emissions mode, containing our heat so the hunters don't see us. Okay, but why? Regari demanded. They started dismantling the station. Guess we're staying here to watch them do it, figure out why. Until then, we're cargo. Or oh, shrugged. Sorry, man. Don't worry, I'll keep an eye on your arm and we've got a field hospital set up in the upper bay. You're in good hands. Regari, Dr. Nod. I know, and I'm grateful. Without you, the clan of females would never have known who Gurmi's choice to replace her as the Mother Supreme is. Is that like appointing an heir, or just a recommendation? A recommendation, but one that's usually listened to, from what I gather. I was only a few days old when Gumi was appointed, Regari shrugged. He learned early on that humans and Gowians had their gesture in common. Gonna have to say a few days, man, Warhorse told him. They're stripping the whole station and, you know... It's a big station. Regari chittered, a touch bitterly. It'll take them months to appoint a successor anyway, even with her recommendation, he said. I'm going to miss her, though. Yeah? Oh, yes. She wasn't just somebody I worked for. If she'd been younger, he trailed off. Though, I might not have approved. This is the I'm the fought so hard to have your human friend adopted into the clan. That's right. She's also the mother of my most recent cub, and she and I... He made a little growling noise, the equivalent of a human clearing their throat. It's complicated. Man, I know how that feels. I doubt it, Regari countered. Monogamy is the norm in your culture. In ours, it would be something of a scandal. You two are exclusive? I'd like to be, Regari confessed. I haven't told her as much. She and I went for a lot together, but I don't know how she'd take it. Warhorse made a loud, explosive sound that was probably a laugh. Oh man, I definitely know how that one feels, he exclaimed, then calmed. At least the going for a lot together thing. Well, what do you think I should do? Brother, I am the wrong man for female advice. They sat in silence for a while, until Regari noticed that Warhorse and some others of the Nova Hounds were giving him strange looks. What? You're panting. 
Well, yes, Regari said. That's how we deal with heat. We pant, you sweat. He gestured to the fact that everybody on deck was stripped down to the bare minimum they could get away with. And even that was dark, wet, and sticking to the skin. That's amazing. Why? Just, uh, man. It just triggers some weird instincts, I guess. Forget it. Maybe we should fill one of these crates with water for you. Great far from fuel, though, McGurry protested. Wet fur smells worse than you do. This caused Warhorse's expression to get him a stranger. It was almost like a smile, but wide-eyed rather than narrow-eyed. McGurry had no idea what it meant. What? he demanded. Nothing. Fine. Keep your secrets. He enjoyed the occasional smiling glance for a while longer, listening to the music while Warhorse sighed and retrieved a few things. Hard copy prints of some kind from his bag, and began to flip through them. What are those? Uh, ah, fuck it, you're not human. This is Ava. Regari scrutinized the pictures. Ava had plenty set up and taken the images herself, and they were obviously a mating display. It was the only way to explain the curious poses and the odd choice of clothing, both calculated to show off her body to best effect while still hiding away those parts of her anatomy that he knew humans were particularly squeamish about. The prince had a slight worn, off-handed look around the edges. He had to admit, even across the species barrier, he could see the appeal. When you came down to the mechanics of it, there were only so many ways to be bipedal, and only so many ways to birth live young for a planted grade biped's pelvis. The full memory glands on the Gowian female were at the waist and small, as opposed to a human's high and large pair, and the bald skin was totally unattractive, but the curve of flank and hip was almost identical, aside from being more pronounced in humans due to the larger muscles, shorter torso and longer legs. Not that I'm an expert, he declared, but if I had the mouth for it, I think a wolf whistle would be in order. Warhorse laughed at that, then sighed as he looked at the pictures again. I hope she gives me a second shot, he said wistfully. A second shot? She turned you down? We went for a lot together, then we went for a lot without each other, and I was dumb enough to think that she just... Whatever word he was searching for went unfound. There's a general looking up and then standing up as Stainless stepped onto the flight deck, rather more professionally turned out than his men in a full body uniform of some kind, rather than the sleeveless short legged things the rest of the Nova House were wearing. He was even managing the impressive feat of managing to look comfortable in the heat. Fall in, he ordered, quietly. Everyone gathered around him in a rough half circle, the Nova House themselves at the front, and all of their technicians, attendants, and support staff forming a second row behind them. First things first, Tarzan's gonna be fine. Was a nasty injury, but he's had surgery in a crew D shop, so he should be up in about a day or two. So. Major Jackson suffered a fractured fibula and some nasty lacerations, but her early prognosis suggests a full recovery and return to duty in due course. There was a moment of relief, which fell silent again as Stainless raised a hand. We, uh, he began, then cleared his throat. We've had the unhappy privilege of watching three legendary men burn Broly today. Hairs lowered. McGarry watched Baseball put his arm around Warhorse's enormous shoulders and pull him close. All of our lives will go out in time, Stainless continued. That mobile, malleable, expressive human face was alive with muscles wrestling under the surface, fighting to maintain dignity. All of our journeys reach their end. What counts as the end of it all is how that journey was spent, and I for one will consider myself blessed that, for a while, I was able to journey alongside these epic free, and call them my comrades, my friends, and my brothers. He swallowed, lowered his head for a second, then raised it again, and Regaia admired the strength that he managed to force into his voice. Let these mementos into the history of this new regiment, and mark the start of a tradition. We will never leave a man behind. Whether he comes back with his shield, upon it, or in keepsake only, he comes back. We will make it home, one way or another. As nods of agreement created a gentle susurrus around the bay, he produced three small battered items from his pocket. Star Sergeant Brady Stevenson, Thor. He laid the little patch of cloth that Warhorse had salvaged from the crushed armor on the table. Sergeant First Class Leo Price. Sterling. A metal tag on a chain. Master Sergeant James Jones. Another swatch of cloth. Lexi. By now, all the seven men standing directly in front of him had their arms interlinked, across one another's shoulders or around each other's waists. Around the bay, Death Otters were standing at attention, some fighting back their emotions, others displaying them openly. 
Samus took a deep breath. It's still early days for the Saw. We've been blooded today, and despite our losses, we acquitted ourselves superbly under most difficult circumstances, in keeping with the finest traditions of our parent units, he declared. I expect that we will go on to great things in due course, which is why I'm going to conclude with what I hope will be the regimental motto. So listen carefully. Remember this. Heads raised and gave him their full attention. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculties. In form and moving how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In appreciation, how like a god. He set his jaw and saluted fiercely. Every one of the humans present copied him. When gods fall, we will remember them. Twenty humans spoke as one. We will remember them. Two torturous days passed, punctuated by a steady rhythm. First a siren would sound, marking the moment when their orbit carried them below the horizon from the Zorn's perspective, and the ship would wake up, flinging out its force fields and radiating all of its accumulated heat towards the sun in a concentrated beam with breathtaking efficiency. Regari could actually feel the temperature drop, until he was comfortable again, and the humans were sighing with relief even as their breath condensed on newly chilled air. Chores would be done, the water would be recycled, and people would take comfort showers and use the latrines, making best use of every moment that the ship could operate normally, before its orbit carried it back into the line of sight with the hunters, and they were forced to endure another three hours of mounting heat and humidity as best they could. In hindsight, not taking Warhols up on that bar fight would have been wise. He would have been shivering and at risk of hypothermia at the cold end of the cycle. They spent the time watching movies, huddled around a tiny tablet computer in a way that must surely have made the heat worse, but at least it was entertainment. He wound up sitting on Warhorse's shoulders again, so as to have a good view. McGurry had watched a number of movies with Shu, and had mostly enjoyed them, though he had wondered what in Gao's name she got out of horror movies. She mostly watched them from behind her hands, squirming and occasionally shrieking, while the poor, traumatised Gaoians had been even worse affected. Humans could be dark in their storytelling, it seemed. He had not watched a movie like this one, though. It almost had a gowing in it. Too short, oddly proportioned, with digital grey feet and strange facial proportions and markings that suggested a chromosomal disorder and clearly built on death order anatomy, making him stockier and far stronger than any real gowing in still. Why would you want to save the galaxy? Because I am one of the idiots who lives in it! It was ridiculous, but also a huge amount of fun, and certainly distracted from the relentless heat. He was required to check with the hospital set up in the bay on the opposite side of the ship every few hours, and was surprised when they removed his dressings. The stump underneath had healed perfectly, unbelievably fast, though who had snuck him a dose of cruiser, when and how, were a mystery. When he got back to Gao, he'd be ready to receive a prosthetic the moment he landed. Finally, orders were given. Objects cleared away, whose equipment battened down, and everyone settled down ready for the jump, which passed with a barely perceptible jolt in his stomach. At once, the cooling cycle started, and this time, the temperature stayed down. The long wait was over. Major Owen Powell Azimus Sharman had a few design quirks that had been intended to keep it inside the footprint occupied by the original camp, and one of these was his narrow hallways and corridors, the narrowest of which, Powell was certain, was the one outside his office. Throw in that saw men were universally large, and that made getting past one another a challenge sometimes, which is why he paused at the intersection on seeing Ares coming towards him. The younger man picked up the pace and squeezed past him at the corner. Shouldn't you be seeing Avis, Sergeant? Powell asked. Should we worried about you? We were just... organising the wake, sir, Adam explained. Powell nodded. Good. I'll be bloody well upset if you lot don't drink every drop of alcohol on this planet, you hear me? Yes, sir. Powell exhaled through his nose, aware that he was going to miss having an NCO with whom he could get away with sharing a joke. But then again, that hadn't been the nature of his relationship with Lexi to begin with either. Good night, sir, Adam said and turned to go. Ares. The young man turned to face him again. Sir? Lexi and I were in the habit of sharing a post-mission drink. You would be very welcome to join me in keeping that tradition alive. Adam blinked at him, then nodded, swallowing. I'd like that, he managed. Come on. Powell unlocked his office and led the way in visiting the top of his filing cabinet and retrieving a bottle of Clemvidic and two cut crystal glasses. One for us, and one each for anybody who didn't come back, he explained. 
pouring just enough for there definitely to be whiskey in each glass, but not enough that four of them would actually get either of them intoxicated. They chimed glasses and nod them back. He was slightly impressed that Adam had no worse reaction to it than clearing his throat and a slightly pinched expression for a second, considering it was probably his first taste of whiskey. Power poured the second pair of drinks. I'm recommending Price to the Victoria Cross, a legacy for the George Cross, he said. And as far as I'm concerned, Jackson and Semenza deserve the Medal of Honor. They saved the bloody lot of us, but they'll probably settle for less. There'll be a few other decorations getting handed out too. He paused and shrugged. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure I care about medals right now. They drank again. Adam had the look of a man who wanted to ask questions, but was restraining himself. You've got permission to speak freely right now, lad, Power told him. Make use of it. I don't grant it often. Just a question, sir. Go on, then. How are you holding up? Christ. Remind me not to let you ask freely too often. You get right down to business, don't you? Sorry, sir, I... No, no, fair question. He appreciated it, in fact. He rubbed the bridge of his nose and drank his third glass while he thought. Adam copied him. I'm not... I try not to be a weak man. But ordering a friend to his death... Power put his glass down and reached for the bottle one last time. It beats you up. I'd be kind of worried if it didn't, sir. Power poured again and nodded. True. It'd be a lonely fucking job if I didn't get up with my men, you know. It just... It needs to be understood that the mission comes first. When it's one man versus every man, I can't... I won't be fucking sentimental about it. I have to send the right man for the job. Whoever that might be. I didn't get that when I signed up. I didn't confessed. Well... What about now you know what it's like? Sir, speaking candidly. Powell handed him his glass. I thought we bloody were. Well then, if I was the right man for the job, I guess I wouldn't just expect you to send me. I'd want you to. Powell nodded. Seven in his glass for a moment. Aye. And I reckon Legacy would have said the same. They toasted and drank for the fourth and final time. Go on, Sergeant. You better things to be doing and prettier people to be doing them with than commiserating with your commanding officer, he said, as he set his glass down. Um, coping. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, Sergeant. You're approaching the commune of females and cubs, male. Who comes? Regari knew not to underestimate the females who took guard duty outside the communes at night. Ceremonial though their role was, they took it seriously, and would be expert shots with those Porsche rifles. Not that they ever did shoot anybody, but it paid to respect that fact. He halted in the light. Officer Regari of Clan Whitecrest, he announced, formerly of the executive staff of Marvel Supreme Gumi. Regari? One of the guards stepped forward to get a better look at him. Why, say, it is you. We thought you were dead. He waved his left arm to show off his new cybernetic paw. I very nearly was, he said. You know him, Sister Mune? The other guard asked. He is who he says he is, Mune assured her. I escort him. Who are you here to see, male? The second guard interrogated him, clearly not satisfied with Mune's reassurance. To judge from Mune's resigned and impatient body language, this was nothing unusual. Maybe he should court the young female after all. If nothing else, Mune would benefit from knowing she had allies. I'm here to inform the late Marvel Supreme's chosen successor of her nomination, he announced, picking the one of the three truthful answers he could have given on the grounds that it was probably the least controversial. Hmm. You may enter. The guard finally stopped glaring at him, though she didn't unwind exactly. Mune just flicked her wrist irritably and walked alongside him through the commune's doors. Did she choose Ima? She asked. Yolna, Regari revealed. Ima's voice made the both freeze on the spot. That makes sense. She'd been cuddling and rocking a tiny newborn in the moonlight and was invisibly still, and chittered a little at the way both Muon and Regari flinched. Yorna's a good choice. She won't be afraid to speak her mind. I will leave you two alone, shall I? Muon stepped away a little, out of earshot. Ima made an amused face. That poor little sister has watched too many human romance movies, she declared. What do you mean? Oh, she's convinced you and I are an item or something. Ima growled a little wirily. You have seen those human movies. You know how they react. They get jealous over mating partners. That's not us, is it? Well, Regari paused, then nodded, bearing his disappointment. No, you're right, it's not. She stood and gave him a friendly nose rub, as of old and close friends. I like you too much, Regari. I hate to fall out with you over mating contracts. 
That, at least, was a dose of welcome, soothing cold water to balm his burnt self-esteem. You do? Oh, yes. I may glanced up and down the commune concourse and then leaned in conspiratorially. If I had to choose just one... Wait, what happened to your paw? She tried to take it intimately, and I found herself holding smooth carbon fibre instead of fur. He grimaced at it. It's a long story. I'll tell you what happened over breakfast, if you'll do me a favour. Name it. It's about Sister Myun. Starship Negotiable Curiosity. Deep Space. I think we found one of them. One of them? I thought we were looking for a single escape pod. There was a sign from the ship's owner and commander. Yes, we're looking for a single escape pod, but the ship launched too. Huzzah blinked at his courty employer. But, Bedu, if the ship launched two, why are we only after one? Bedu repeated his weary sigh. Because the client is paying us five million to rhetoric currency units for the escape pod with one of your cousins on it, and not for the other one. But why? Mrnfrua interrupted him, saving Bedu's headache for progressing any further. Client says, client pays, we do, no more questions, she snapped. Bedu nodded subtly at his Kumbu pilot, thanking her. But, Hasra! Bedu snaps, the melody's tone. I tell you this as a colleague of three years. The subject of your species' remarkable intelligence is a focus of frequent discussion among the courty. And may I say that you yourself are a type specimen for the exact qualities that we find so fascinating. Nevertheless, there is a time for not asking questions, and this is one such, hmm? Hussar was practically glowing with pride. Why, thank you, Bedu, he said. Indeed. Please be so kind as to man the scoop field should we need to bring them aboard. Of course. Once the gangly blue shape of their junior crewman had left the bridge, Mubufu shot her employer a questioning glance. What? Bedu asked her. I've never known you tell a direct lie before, she said quietly. Nor did I this time, Bedu replied amicably. So, Vistak intelligence really is a subject of frequent discussion among the courty? Bedu granted himself the luxury of satisfaction at his own cleverness. The Kronguru was by no means an idiot herself, and that meant that if he snuck his veiled insult past her, and Huzu would never notice it. Indeed, he told her. We often find ourselves wondering how a species so totally dim ever managed to invent the wheel. Murphua took a second to process that, then made a kind of fluttering purring noise in her chest, her species equivalent of laughter. I see. And we're coming up on the life raft. Does the transponder code match? Bedu demanded, examining the little puck shaped craft on his screen. Please, she clutched annoyed. That was the first thing I checked. Very good. Run the disruption and scan their contents. Won't they notice? If they are who we want, it will not matter. And if they are not, well, they will never find out what happened. Please run the scan. Moonfrew raised a hand to acknowledge the order, then followed it. A second later, data poured onto Bedu's command screen. Free death orders, alas, he noted. All quite badly injured too. Fine, stop the scan. We'd better pick up that other ALV wake. Are you sure they won't have noticed? Mumpu asked, already changing course. Behind them, the escape pod blinked away as the slight change in their vector translated to a separation of light seconds in the heartbeat. At most, they may have felt a sensation of time, having done something strange, Bedu conceded. I doubt they will pay it a second thought. Dementor Road. Falkfer. Simbreen. The Far Reaches. Out of Ares. The little wooden Eden sign that Sarah had once given them rattled when Ava opened the door. She paused on seeing him, and then threw herself straight into a hug with such force that, despite the disparity between her mass and his strength, Adam had to take a step back to absorb her. Oh my god, Adam! She couldn't even fit her arms all the way around him. She'd been right. Things had changed. Are you okay? People are saying Lexi didn't come back? Yeah, Adam nodded. He, um... Ava made a sad, almost childish little sound of loss. Are you... all right? I wouldn't have come back if not for him, Adam told her. Or Leo, either. They... none of us would. She retreated into the apartment and sat down on the couch. God damn it. Adam shut the door as he entered, and sat next to her. Yeah. There was a melancholy silence for a little while, which Adam finally broke. Lexi... Gave me some advice before we headed out. This may not be the best time to follow up on it, but... What? He... Helped me figure out what you are to me. Ava blinked at him, then turned to face him, giving him her attention. Adam took a hand. You're... This amazing, gorgeous, talented woman that I'd like to get to know better, he said. 
Ava paused, but then a smile broke through in her face like the dawn rising. Yeah? Adam nodded. Ava looked at him for a long, contemplative moment, and then sighed, and he could see the tension and misery flow out of her as she wiped away a tear. It's a date, she said. <laughs>